Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We are going to start our meeting. <clears throat> Dear colleagues, thank you very much for joining us uh, today uh, at this uh, stock-taking event on, uh, on progress uh, in the fight against corruption in Ukraine. I'm going to chair this meeting together with the, my colleague Rebecca Harms, who is the chair of the uh, uh, Uranus Parliamentary Assembly and also a member of the Parliamentary Delegation for Ukraine. Uh, let me, uh, first of all, welcome uh, particularly warmly uh, our special guest today, Commissioner Johannes Han. Han. Commissioner, thank you for being with us. And uh, uh, we are always happy uh, to have a chance to have this exchange of views with you here. <coughs> Uh, I'm going to give the floor to the Commissioner just in a second. Before that, I would like uh, to uh, inform you that we have uh, interpretation in English and Ukrainian, and also this meeting is uh, public and uh, web-streamed. <coughs> uh, once again, thank you, Commissioner, for being with us today and uh, 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 for, for uh, your support for this, uh, for this uh, joint event uh, uh, organized uh, with the European Commission and the uh, European Parliament. Uh, our meeting reflects uh, high importance that we here uh, in the Parliament, but gen more generally in all EU institutions, we attach to the fight against corruption. Uh, as EU parliamentarians that deal uh, with Ukraine on an everyday basis uh, uh, within the framework of the parliamentary delegation, we see it as our particular duty to encourage this progress of fighting against corruption as much as possible. And uh, today's meeting uh, uh, aims uh, not only at, as I said, stock taking of, the, uh, of uh, what has been uh, done and how is the situation right now in Ukraine, but also uh, is meant as an encouragement to all those who fight against corruption and uh, support uh, for their actions, uh, both uh, here, but especially uh, in Ukraine, in Kiev. Uh, in this uh, context, I would like to welcome also our Ukraine, Ukrainian friends and guests. Uh, I will introduce them just in a second. <clears throat> uh, I'm looking forward to this meeting, and I attach uh, high hopes uh, to our uh, discussions, because, uh, as we all know, uh, the, f the, the issue of fighting uh, against corruption is in Ukraine is uh, one of the most important, and also it is an issue that determines the progress uh, uh, of uh, our uh, cooperation between Ukraine and the European Union in many other fields. Uh, without uh, <coughs> further delay, uh, I would like, uh, Commissioner, uh, to, uh, to, to give you the floor and uh, uh, to give us your introductory remarks. Please, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Darius, uh, dear Rebecca, um, Ambassador, friends, colleagues um, from Ukraine. Uh, thank you for coming here today, uh, though it's not uh, the best weather, but I can tell you I was yesterday in Tunis, and even there it was cold and rainy, so it seems to be everywhere, but hopefully in our heart uh, the sun is shining. Um, what we all have in common is, uh, and this is our commitment uh, to Ukraine. That's why we are here. And uh, um, also your presence, in particular presence of uh, our friends from Ukraine, is a proof of that. And uh, thank you to our speakers, uh, indeed, coming uh, today to Brussels to share their experiences with us. And thank you to Rebecca Harms and Darius Rosati for organizing this event, which indeed goes back to uh, uh, discussions I had with uh, Rebecca some time ago. We were and still are concerned about uh, recent developments in Ukraine in the anti-corruption area. Ukraine ranks today number 130 of 180 countries in the Corruption Perception Index of 2017. That needs to be tackled urgently and, of course, with uh, determination. Let me first mention some important positive developments. New anti-corruption institutions have been created from scratch. The electronic asset declaration system for public officials and politicians was launched 
in summer 2016. More than one million public uh, officials have already submitted uh, such declarations, but I will come back on this uh, issue uh, in my uh, later remarks. The government decision in 2016 to increase energy prices to import parity levels has eliminated the largest uh, source of corruption, taking, it, uh, taking advantage of the price difference between different uh, prices for households and companies. This tariff increase meant that Navcogas, the Ukraine gas monopoly, went from an $8 billion loss two years ago to a $1 billion profit uh, last year, becoming the largest taxpayer in Ukraine in the process. We all know that savings of uh, $9 billion in one year don't come from efficiency gains only, but also from eliminating corruption and Indeed, I like the differentiation between technical and non-technical leaks and losses. The energy sector and others have already benefited from the pro soro electronic procurement uh, system, which has helped to reduce corruption and ensure the, a transparent and more efficient spending of public funds. Also, from a different angle, taking licenses away from over 90 banks has eliminated corruption from banking transactions. So far, so good, but let me now focus on where the international community, the international financial institutions, and I see an urgent need for action. Legislation and institutions, which we continue to support with our programs, are in place. But uh, as I said many times, laws need to be implemented and institutions uh, need to work efficiently. That's uh, what really counts. And that's what is uh, important for the Ukrainian people and for me. We saw attempts to undermine the very institutions that are engaged in the fight against corruption. NABU is doing a very important job under very difficult circumstances. The lack of convictions uh, in high-level corruption cases is a major concern. There has no been a single judgment against any high-level official in any of NABU's cases uh, so far. Ukraine institutions, uh, uh, Ukraine's in, um, institutional architecture needs to be completed by the creation of an independent anti-corruption court in line with Venice Commission's recommendations. This is one of the conditions uh, for further financial support from the IMF, and I'm in constant and close contact uh, with the IMF and other financial institutions, and I can reassure you um, their patience is indeed uh, going down, uh, to say it politely. It's equally important to rapidly lift uh, the obligation for civic activists to submit e-declarations to allow civil society to play its watchdog role without undue obstacles and interference and to allow for the participation of international partners in supervisory boards to state-owned enterprises. It's simply unacceptable to target civil society in such a way. The Venice Commission's opinion is clear in that regard, and I have heard announcements and promises, uh, but nothing happened so far. This obligation will enter into force on the 1st of April, unless action is taken. I really expect this to happen now. The slowdown of anti-corruption reforms has concrete negative consequences for Ukraine, notably the non-disbursement of the last tranche of 600 million euro of macro-financial assistance because several conditions were not fulfilled, most of them in anti-corruption area. The Commission has just proposed a new macro-financial assistance program for up to 1 billion euro, which will be linked to policy conditions demonstrating concrete reform progress. The old unfulfilled conditions of the previous program need to be fulfilled as a precondition for the disbursement of the first tranche. Here I come back on the e-declaration, uh, as this is one of the conditions. They need to be verified. Only a few, little more than 100, were verified. An automated uh, system still needs to be in place, at least for a first level control. 
Let me add that the Commission's uh, visa suspension mechanism report of last December addressed the shortcomings <laughs> I just mentioned, and we take this uh, very seriously. But you are not alone on this uh, challenging journey. The European Union is ready to continue its support for Ukraine in this process, and I would like to thank ECHA. I excuse if I uh, don't... Uh, <laughs> Thank you. But it's, I think it's much nicer to address somebody with a first name, and she became famous with Eka. Uh, she is the head of the anti-corruption initiative. Everybody knows her, and I thank you and your team for your work that has already included important advice and some trainings and study visits uh, for the staff of new anti-corruption agencies. So I wish you not only excellent discussions, but again, I hope that this um, event uh, creates the necessary public awareness, attention, in particular amongst Ukrainian authorities, to understand Europe is serious on this issue. Europe is very serious on this issue, and it's one of the key elements for the further development of Ukraine. We are on a pivotal crossroad. If we are together not able to manage this, I'm not very optimistic for the immediate future of Ukraine. And one should not forget the elections next year. And the fact that everybody in Ukraine, I mean, amongst politicians, is already in, in a pre-electoral yeah. mode and mood, um, um, uh, should also be understood. Citizens in Ukraine expect a um, sincere and successful fight against corruption. So I think those politicians who are able to present credible um, not only proposals, but uh, results might be, um, so to say, uh, awarded <coughs> by voters. And it's the executive who has now the chance to do this. Uh, so it's also a plea that uh, uh, one doesn't lose time and waste time, but use the opportunities and uh, take the necessary measures. It's in the interest of the country and uh, citizens there deserve it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, <coughs> Commissioner, uh, for these introductory remarks. And now I would like to ask uh, Rebecca Harbs uh, to uh, give a, 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 an, in, an introduction on, on her part, after which we uh, will start our discussions. Rebecca. So thank you uh, very much also from my side uh, to the team of the delegation, the team in my office, uh, the team of Mr. Rosati, and also um, Mr. Hahn and uh, his people to be involved in the preparation uh, for this uh, meeting today and uh, this very important uh, exchange. Um, I had uh, some calls, I must say, uh, which uh, surprised me a bit uh, from Ukrainian friends uh, during the last days, and everybody asked me, Rebecca, why the European Parliament has always to discuss the negative problems of Ukraine, especially corruption. Um, I made a long list uh, to respond uh, to all those calls um, about all the events we recently organized uh, among uh, the Friends of Ukraine in the European Commission. So we had events uh, to remember uh, the fourth anniversary of uh, annexation and occupation of Crimea. Uh, we had uh, events um, on uh, the situation in Donbass. We had uh, recently also shared by Mr. Rosati the screening uh, of the film, uh, the very impressive documentary uh, on uh, the uh, reality of war in the airport of Donetsk. We showed films about uh, political prisoners uh, in Russia, Ukrainian political prisoners uh, in Russia. Uh, we are discussing the humanitarian situation in the East and how we can improve uh, our support. So uh, I would say um, Friends of Ukraine uh, and uh, the European institutions are doing their utmost uh, to uh, so deal with all the challenges in Ukraine and to really uh, so um, so to, to really support uh, the huge uh, so uh, the huge challenges and uh, change processes in in Ukraine um, to uh, be honest uh, from my side uh, there is one deep reason why I'm so interested uh, in the issue we discussed today 
I had uh, the uh, big honor yeah, during the period of uh, Orange uh, Revolution already, but then especially also during the uh, month of uh, Revolution of Dignity uh, in Ukraine, uh, to be able to join Ukrainians, to be in a very friendly way uh, invited uh, to join and understand uh, their fight and what it was about, I really understood during these uh, days uh, in winter 2013-14 on the Maidan. And uh, so uh, to make Ukraine a truly uh, democratic state is the biggest issue was and is the biggest issue stemming from this period of revolution of dignity and well-functioning institutions which serve in the first uh, priority the citizens and nothing else is one of the core challenges in this reform process. And uh, in this, I would say the fight against uh, corruption on all its levels uh, is uh, one of uh, the biggest uh, challenges uh, we face together. Um, I think it's a very balanced approach we have chosen for this stock-taking event, as we call it. So we will talk about the achievements, institutional achievements, and we will talk about uh, the challenges. Recently, I joined a group of uh, young Ukrainians. Uh, they organize so-called um, tours, anti-corruption tours, walks uh, in the center of Kiev. And I found it uh, heartwarming yeah, to be in a very cold way, in a, in, in a, on a very cold day, in heavy snowfall, together with these young Ukrainian citizens in the center of Kiev, visiting different places, uh, different uh, buildings where you can learn about progress and problems in the fight against corruption. For example, we were standing in front of the health ministry. And uh, those young Ukrainians, in a very proud way, explained to the crowds joining uh, the walk, uh, they explained about the big achievements of Prozor, so this uh, public procurement reform, which really helps against corruption. And uh, they also had stories what this means uh, for the health sector and what this means for the reform of the health sector. Uh, so. Um, it was a mixed picture which we got, but uh, Ukrainians, especially young Ukrainians, are on the one side very proud about the achievements and on the other side uh, very fond uh, to go further uh, in this uh, reform process. In this anti-corruption walk, I think another issue of the process became very visible for me again. There are um, not uh, really two competing sides necessary in this uh, process. So on the one side, uh, the official Kiev, uh, the institutions, uh, so the anti-corruption institutions, the parliament, the government, etc., the ministries, and on the other side, the civil society and non-governmental organizations. So if we want to be successful in this fight, we need, uh, as we saw it in the very beginning of the reform process, we need a deep cooperation uh, in between uh, the uh, civil society and uh, the officially responsible uh, institutions uh, of uh, Ukraine. And uh, if there are problems, um, so if there are uh, arguments, uh, don't be astonished. Those arguments, we know it from all. Uh, debates in societies, not only in Ukraine, uh, but also in our EU member states. And that Ukraine has this uh, lively debate uh, on corruption, uh, marks the very difference, for example, uh, of a country like Ukraine towards the Russian state of today. So I'm uh, very pleased that the guests we wanted to have here for the debate joined the meeting and uh, I'm uh, very curious um, how this will develop and I'm sure that in the end we will develop also proposals how to uh, support from the European level those who are tackling uh, the awful problem of corruption in Ukraine. Thank you for joining. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And this talks a lot. Uh, 
now uh, I would like to uh, to tell you about the, how how we are going to organize our meeting, uh, the, the 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 following part of our meeting. First, we will start with a panel <coughs> dedicated to more institu to uh, to institutional aspects of the fight against corruption since 2014 and the role of the EU uh, to uh, to support this, these institutions. And uh, in this part of the discussion, we will have a, a chance to listen to our Ukrainian guests and friends. Uh, let me present them now to you, Mr. Artyom Sitnik, uh, uh, whom I welcome very wholeheartedly, I must say. We uh, very much appreciate your efforts and work which you uh, have been doing uh, in the, uh, within the framework of the NABU of office, and uh, we are, of course, uh, aware of the difficulties and attempts to disturb the work of this office. We are looking forward to hear your opinions <coughs> on how we can help you and uh, what should be done in order to make your work more uh, effective. We have uh, Mr. Nazar Holodnitsky, whom I welcome, who is the head of the Specialized Anti-Corruption Prosecutor's Office, SAPO. This is the second important uh, official in state in institution charged with, uh, 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 with the fight against corruption. We have our friend Ambassador Mikola Toshitsky with us. Uh, welcome, Ambassador. Uh, I also would like to welcome Mr. Martin uh, Kreutner, Dean and Executive Secretary of the International Anti-Corruption Academy. <coughs> and we have two prominent representatives of the uh, civic society uh, uh, with us from Ukraine, uh, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Eka Keshel Alashvili, I'm sorry. Welcome Eka with us again. <laughs> <laughs> Head of the EU program uh, Anti-Corruption Anti -corruption Initiative and also Mr. Dmitro Bulak, uh, Director of the Kharkiv Anti-Corruption Center. Uh, uh, since we wanted also to look into not only on the, uh, at the institutional aspects of the fight against corruption, but also uh, look at uh, specific sectors uh, that are mostly plagued by, uh, by corruption. Uh, we will, of course, uh, uh, dig into the energy sector in this context, and uh, on, that, uh, on, in this, uh, uh, on that topic, we will have uh, a chance to listen to two uh, guest speakers, Elena Osmowska, <coughs> who is here, uh, and she is the head of corporate communication of Naftohas. And, uh, and uh, Mr. Thorsten Wellert, team leader, support group for Ukraine from the European Commission. <coughs> I welcome you warmly. Uh, and, of course, I welcome all other guests that are this morning with us. <coughs> uh, and I hope we are going to have an exciting uh, discussion. Uh, so we start the first panel. I would like uh, now to apologize. Uh, I have uh, to go to another meeting for uh, not so long, and I would like to ask uh, my colleague Rebecca Harms to take over and, uh, and uh, moderate the first panel. Rebecca, please. Thank you, Darius. Um, and uh, we uh, directly uh, go into the presentations uh, of this panel. And uh, we have uh, agreed that we start with, with Mr. Sitnik, sitting close to me. Good morning uh, to all. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of this uh, meeting. I, I feel it's very important to have the occasion uh, to uh, talk about uh, the anti-corruption uh, fight in uh, Ukraine. I, I f fully agree with what has been set up to now. Uh, I do think that the anti-corruption fight is, is one of the most important things going on in, uh, in uh, uh, Ukraine. I represent the National Anti-Corruption uh, Bureau of Ukraine, NABU, the main task is uh, the fight against corruption. Uh, the fact uh, that uh, there had not been uh, an anti-corruption activity that led us to the uh, revolution of uh, dignity. And uh, I must say that even today, uh, uh, we still have a very low rating uh, on the Index of Transparency International. 
the, uh, the Nabu is uh, made up of 700 uh, people. All of this was uh, created from scratch. I started uh, working in April 2015. I, I was uh, the only one there to start with. Uh, uh, we uh, moved along quite quickly. Uh, and in uh, 4th of December in 2015, we uh, started investigations. Uh, the attitude towards this was a little bit uh, uh, skeptical to, to, to start with in that uh, uh, nobody thought that we were would be able to uh, were going to be able to work effectively. But things have changed now, and uh, we have now quite a number of investigations that we've done. I'm not I'm not going to go into detail because that would be uh, overly uh, uh, long. But uh, along with other uh, instances uh, uh, in the judiciary uh, there have uh, uh, the and and we were able indeed to uh, show uh, the uh, anti-corruption act activities uh, uh, on the on the level of uh, government instances and this was a, f a first in the history of uh, of Ukraine this where people were uh, 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 us to come before with guys. Of course, this, this was uh, there was a lot uh, of uh, difficulty. Uh, uh, there were constant uh, changes to the, to uh, 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 the laws. The uh, the last draft draft law last uh, December was uh, the, had had a pur the purpose of destroying all of these anti corruption. Uh, uh, instances. Uh, it's, it's a question of, of uh, inadequate uh, uh, will. Uh, uh, we uh, we think that we're doing the right thing because if nobody criticized us, we would uh, wonder if if uh, we were doing the right thing. We have now the first effects of uh, of our work. I'm just going to quote a couple a couple of uh, examples. One of which. Could, Concerns uh, uh, has, uh, the This was uh, one of the first things that the, that we did uh, with the deputy Inishinko, uh, liquidating the corruption uh, schemes uh, of uh, uh, during the the. the 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 three years that we w worked on this, it was uh, we gained uh, twenty five million hryvnia, uh, uh, and then uh, more recently one million three hundred thousand uh, hryvnia. This just shows what kind of resources are hidden in uh, Ukraine and uh, what Ukraine uh, could uh, benefit if uh, if this uh, fight carries on. Uh, then uh, uh, there was question of, of contraband, of, of trafficking, uh, of uh, 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 the four of four hundred million hryvnia per day on uh, uh, the customs of uh, of Ukraine, and uh, this shows uh, that this is a real fight against uh, corruption and and the, the various schemes. Uh, Linked to corruption, I think uh, we have a big problem at this point in time uh, because we are uh, <laughs> under a tremendous amount of, of pressure. If we uh, transfer these investigations to the courts, and they get blocked uh, there. If, if we looked at at uh, the results of the works uh, of the work of the courts. Uh, uh, in in order to uh, uh, regain uh, costs that have been lost, there's really not much uh, to be proud of. Uh, 
thanks uh, to our European uh, partners and their help, uh, we have constantly uh, asked uh, for uh, a judiciary organ that could uh, 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 take care of this uh, situation. The government was not... Uh, very much in agreement with us at the uh, at the beginning, uh, uh, there was a memorandum signed between Ukraine and the uh, IMF. There were recommendations uh, uh, coming from the EU, but up to uh, last October, the uh, Ukrainian government was not uh, not uh, very much in in favor, and this did not. Uh, uh, allow us to move forward uh, in this uh, in this sphere be because uh, the, we need to have uh, uh, arrests and and uh, we need to have uh, guilty verdicts. Uh, uh, we need to have uh, honest, uh, objective uh, uh, results in the in in the courts. So I am very happy that, uh, nevertheless, the, the process that has started uh, in in uh, December, which consisted of trying to get rid of uh, of the Nabu and the draft law in in Barada, was almost to vote voted. Uh, rather than that. Uh, Given the the messages that we've been getting uh, from really all over all over the world, the world and now oh, uh, we we have a draft law for an uh, anti creation of an anti corruption court. This draft law has been adopted in first reading, and I do very much hope that it will be definitively uh, adopted uh, shortly because this is a, this is a very uh, um, important aspect of uh, of our work, uh, the, the cases that are already at the courts and others that are being transmitted to, to the courts. The number of cases is growing, but the number of verdicts is not. So uh, this is uh, our most important uh, challenge now, because if this state uh, of things carries on for any length of time, society will lose hope and lose confidence. Why is there such um, a resistance? After our first investigations, and, and uh, indeed these were, these were very difficult uh, for the uh, political uh, elite uh, because uh, the untouchables, quote unquote, in uh, Ukrainian uh, politics don't exist uh, anymore because now everybody needs to know that if there is proof of their uh, corruption activity, uh, they uh, will uh, have to be responsible. Uh, now, we are looking at the fact uh, and supporting the fact uh, that, that uh, these cases be investigated uh, and that we will get uh, verdicts. In This will uh, allow us to have precedent. Uh, this uh, should, should be possible uh, if in, indeed uh, the uh, s several points in the draft law uh, th that need to be changed will be changed. Thank you very much for your attention. Artyom Sitnik, uh, and uh, we proceed uh, with Mr. Kolodnitsky. Uh, he is the head of uh, Specialized Anti-Corruption Prosecutor's Office, uh, also one of uh, the new uh, anti-corruption institutions. So one of the achievements, please. Thank you. Uh, I will carry on uh, in Ukrainian. Of course, uh, the uh, fight against corruption is uh, everybody's business. So we have done quite a bit over the past three years in order to get uh, results. Uh, there 
th th even there were things even uh, uh, things done uh, uh, before. But as uh, Mr. Sitnik has just said, we do not have uh, verdicts. Uh, I uh, work uh, uh, with this uh, every day in the, in the court system. When when uh, both of our institutions uh, were created, uh, uh, we were told uh, uh, nothing happens because there's no investigation. Then, uh, af, af, uh, af, after that, they said, well, they don't have any uh, 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 guilty people. The, the, then uh, the, it was said, we don't have cases in the courts. Now we say we don't have any any uh, verdicts. The fact of, tr of trans, uh, transmitting the cases uh, to the courts, uh, the, 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 uh, the general uh, prosecutor uh, uh, that does his job, but we, we cannot put pressure on the courts the way it was during uh, the Soviet uh, uh, system. I, am, I cannot and I will not put pressure on the courts. We have to be able to show uh, 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 very uh, solid proof. We need uh, uh, to understand that uh, the the people uh, that are being investigated are uh, very often extremely rich, that have uh, very good lawyers that can invest a lot of costs uh, to defend themselves and only the the verdict of the courts uh, and, uh, that is the only uh, thing is that uh, that uh, th these institutions have been created for and indeed today this is uh, a problem today I unfortunately am somewhat uh, pessimistic as far as uh, creation of the anti-corruption court. Obviously, we want it to work. We want very much for it to work. But uh, we are now uh, at the end of March, and uh, uh, the uh, the draft law is only now uh, it first reading at the Rada. That, uh, that that is why I feel somewhat uh, pessimistic uh, that uh, this court uh, will be able to work. The, uh, during this year. This is something that I would like uh, very much. When we are going to be able to have our investigations and, and cases in the courts, not just the investigation as such, but to have results. It, uh, this is only then that we're, go we're going to be able to say that uh, uh, we have a positive result. This process is in the works. It's problematic. Uh, it's uh, uh, being discussed constantly. I would like to thank our European partners for the help that they are constantly uh, going to give us. It. Well, uh, I think that our efforts will not be in uh, vain. Uh, we have said uh, that there have been success uh, stories, in the, especially in, in the ener energy uh, field. The, these uh, processes are in their first uh, phases. Thank you very much for your attention. It was uh, very brief, <laughs> so it's... Uh, also, so he'll, he'll yeah, yeah, it, it, so. it's. Uh, I, I, we understand uh, that uh, there is a link in between uh, the institutions. Um, now I have uh, to introduce. I, we, we come to you later. Yeah. Um, now I have to introduce uh, Ambassador Mr. Tuchitsky, and uh, before he takes the floor, I would like to thank him that he was ready in the end to change his uh, agenda and uh, to join uh, this uh, event today in the European Parliament. Very welcome, uh, Mr. Tuczynski, Mikula. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Harms, uh, honorable members of the European Parliament, distinguished guests from Ukraine, colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Let me express my gratitude to organizers of this event because it's really, as always, timely. It is an honor for me to address the distinguished audience on the issue as anti-corruption reform in Ukraine, 
which remain among the top priorities of the government in any case. Fight against corruption was among the uh, main requirements of the Ukrainian people during the revolution. And I will speak uh, about what it was done because we agreed with some of our EU colleagues that uh, uh, we also must uh, repeat what it was done already after the few years. As we have here today heads of two key bodies directly responsible for fight against corruption in my country who can present specific issue, I will speak more about general progress. Over the last four years, Ukraine managed to completely overhaul its anti-corruption policy and establish the brand new anti-corruption infra infrastructure from the scratch. This is the most restrictive and comprehensive institutional and legislative framework on fight corruption in Europe. It is true that reforms take time and not every, everything goes smoothly. But in comparison, European states spent much more time to achieve the similar goals. Implementation of VLAP and its 144 criteria also played an important role in achieving these results. I would like to briefly remind you about the key steps made by Ukraine to pursue its anti-corruption reforms. From scratch, we created new state bodies to combat corruption, National Anti-Corruption Bureau, Special Anti-Corruption Prosecution, National Agency for Prevention Corruption. This is the fundamental of the corruption prevention mechanism. New body show practical result in fight against corruption. And it is not about low-level corruption, but corruption at top officials, including, for example, members of parliament and judges. Ukraine success successfully launched an e-declaration system. It is by far the strictest in Europe and has no analog in the world. This system provides both law enforcement agencies and civil society with necessary tools to find possible corruption, corruption uh, or illegal enrichment of any civil servant. The society has got control over about more than a million officials. Ukraine has created a new system of public procurement, Prozoro, which was already mentioned by speakers. It totally eliminates possibility for corruption in the public procurement sphere and allowed the state to save dozens of billions for budget. The system was recognized as being among the best such system in the world. The energy sector for decades used to be the major source of corruption. Now, Naftogaz has become one of the key contributors to the state budget. Introduction of the electronic VAT refund system indeed abused this area. Dozens of so-called tax playground or conver uh, conversion center created under the former leadership have been closed. The cleaning of the banking system eliminated corruption in financial sphere. One of the key elements in our fight against corruption is privatization. On March 7, new law on privatization entered into force. It is goal to ensure efficient, open, and comprehensive privatization of state-owned assets. As of today, about 20 major state-owned enterprises across various industries are up for privatization. The launch of the e-service portal is another important step. This allows to obtain documents from the state register online and preclude influence by corrupt officials. For the first time, well-known names are prosecuted for corruption. The Verkhovna Rada made a record of, of stripping immunity of its member. An important side result the self-cleaning of the judicial system. 
Because of such a system, systems which was established bef before, several thousand of judges re resigned for different reasons. They found it impossible to work under the new strict conditions. During the last couple of years, PGO, NABU, SBU, Ministry of Interior conveyed to the court more than 500 criminal anti-corruption proceedings. More than 1,600 uh, people have been convicted. Ukraine's anti-corruption strategy is not concentrated prominently on the punitive measure. The success depends first of all of elimination of source of corruption. Of course, the work is not finished yet and the corruption is not fully killed. Unfortunately, the weakest link on this process, it is a judicial system. And it was already explained by two or even four, four uh, uh, speakers. In any case, thankfully, uh, the reform of the judiciary is well underway. Ukraine created a completely new Supreme Court, and we had a first reading of high anti-corruption court. The uh, draft law which was presented by President of Ukraine. We hope to have a, in the nearest future a second reading of, of, uh, of uh, such, a, uh, such a law. And uh, the court should be based on the opinion of the Venice Commission and in line with the Ukrainian constitution and national legislation. <laughs> so colleagues, in any case, I think together uh, we, we will implement the whole anti-corruption reforms. This is not a simple objective. And it's exactly when two systems are on a how to say, on a crash, the old one and the new one. But we hope together with uh, sufficient and effective bodies, which was already mentioned, and with support of our EU colleagues, we will achieve such a goal. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ambassador. Thank you, uh, Mikula. Uh, we uh, have agreed that we have uh, two comments now uh, on... Ah, no, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> I was too fast, <laughs> so um, because we are a bit uh, behind the schedule, but not too much. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Kreutner now as the next uh, speaker. He is the Dean and Executive Secretary of the International Anti-Corruption Academy, so with a wider experience on the issue than only in Ukraine. Please. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Madam Chairperson, uh, members of Parliament, uh, Mr. Ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, th thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, if I may get started, let me start by outlining that I'm not speaking entirely on behalf of my organization today, which uh, is an intergovernmental organization uh, of 72 member states, but I do rather speak here on behalf of the advisory board that was established by the European Anti-Corruption Initiative uh, to the European Parliament. And if I may ask, uh, I also brought a short presentation with me. Uh, having said that, again, it is my personal opinions that I do reflect here, and not necessarily the official position of any uh, international organization, the EU or whatever that is. No, it's not on the screen yet. Can we get some technical support? I'm sorry for that, it worked out previously. We had uh, checked it before. It worked. Uh, but yes, I don't. We did. Yeah, we, we did. did it. We did. we did it. It worked. Yes. Yeah. Now he is back. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, yeah. <laughs> that is corruption, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> we are sabotaged and corrupted, obviously, <laughs> in order to get a coffee what's break. What's going on? Can you tell us what's going on? 
Do we have a chance to fix that, or is it impossible? Actually, would I like to share some figures with you and some charts? So it doesn't make sense if I just talk about those issues. Uh, and I think we can trust that we can have it operable here, hopefully, in a few seconds. It is, yeah. <laughs> Sure, I'm fine so with that. Uh, maybe um, we are uh, flexible <laughs> and uh, we decide that we take uh, one of the comments uh, before mm -hmm. Mr. Kreutner speaks um, and uh, we give the floor uh, to, to... It works now? Uh, can you please talk? <laughs> I'm ready to listen. No, 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 sorry. Okay, good. So... <laughs> So um, uh, let's, uh, let's be flexible. Uh, let's uh, invite uh, uh, Mr. Bulak uh, Mito, who he comes uh, from uh, Kharkiv and is there responsible oh, for... It's working. Oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> so no flexibility needed. So then we turn, uh, we turn around and uh, follow Mr. Kreutner now. Okay, thanks very much. So uh, obviously curiosity was raised by this intervention of uh, some technical problems. No, jokes aside, thanks very much. Uh, as Commissioner Hahn was referring to the uh, Corruption Perception Index, let me, let me get started maybe with the Corruption Perception Index and uh, show that to you. Next one, please. Uh, it's open source, that means you can uh, Google it, you will easily find it. The Corruption Perception Index was first uh, published in 1995. And if you have a look uh, into uh, the country ranking, you will find the Ukraine with a figure, uh, an absolute figure of uh, 3 0, 30, uh, breed it down, if I may say, uh, in, in the ranking. Again, everything is open source, so just have a look, on your, a look yourself. Uh, the average uh, score, globally speaking, is about 40, 4007, uh, and as I said, the Ukraine uh, uh, ranks with a score of about 30, so below global average. How about the Ukraine neighbors? You have here Poland on the one hand, Slovakia on the other, Romania, Hungary, Belarus, Moldova, and the Russian Federation. And uh, as I said before, Ukraine with a score of 30, so it's pretty also relatively low uh, even among the neighboring states. If we have another uh, look uh, as far as uh, the region is concerned, the average score among the Eastern Europe and Central Asian countries uh, is 34. Georgia ranking best with 56 and the worst uh, according to Transparency International is Turkmenistan with 19. If we take a positive approach, one may argue that the Ukraine made uh, one point up uh, from 2016 to 2017. However, uh, if you have a closer look then, and uh, I undertook that in the, in the next chart, uh, with outlining the scores, uh, scoring of the Ukraine starting in 1998 until today, you have basically pretty stable graph, if I may argue, uh, since this score was published as far as the country is concerned. If, uh, if we compare that with some other countries, and I took uh, Finland, Germany, Georgia, and Poland to compare with, you see on the one hand that uh, there is a decrease even among the best-ranking countries like Finland, uh, but there is also the possibility to improve, and again, I took the countries uh, not actually from the same region, but at least some former Soviet Union countries, uh, as far as Georgia and Poland are concerned. Georgia is here in light blue, and uh, Poland is in dark red. You see that improvement uh, is, is possible. We are not a post-Soviet country. We are not a Soviet Union country. Poland. Sorry, sorry. You're absolutely right. I have to correct myself. Uh, for sure, former Warsaw Pact country. That needs to be precise, and I apologize for that. Absolutely right. Uh, in comparing some other indices, development indices, uh, I also share with you here uh, 
the uh, Human Development Index and also in yellow uh, the Freedom House Index or what was previously called the Freedom House Index. So there is a pretty stable um, uh, development obviously, meaning basically keeping the situation uh, as it was before. Going into more details, uh, uh, we also have here on the next slide the perception. The perception by Ukrainian nationals as far as their institutions are concerned over a period of eight years. That means you have from uh, um, a survey from 27 to 29, 2011 and 2015. And uh, I would argue with basically uh, following a global trend, regrettably uh, also in the country, uh, the parliament or ranks rather prone to corruption with an increase from 2011 to 2015 of about 6%. The cabinet of ministers uh, also saw an increase as far as perception is concerned uh, by 8%. Uh, the presidential, uh, president and president's administration, an increase of 6%, also from 2011 to 2015. The oblast, uh, which is basically a county level, um, roughly stable, an increase of 3%, and last but not least, city community level, so an increase uh, in those four years uh, by roughly about 2%. So the core issue, and I think that was also mentioned by pretty many of the previous speakers is, uh, can we have the next, thank you, is uh, uh, judiciary again. And as I would agree with uh, one of my previous speakers that we should not put too much pressure on, uh, on the courts in the individual cases, I would argue that we definitely have to put pressure on the judiciary system uh, in order to deliver. That means uh, judicial independence must not be an excuse for not delivering. It is, uh, I think, the right of the people, the right of the populace, that one of the key functions of the state uh, and of a democracy, and that is by the end of the day, uh, the judiciary definitely, also the judiciary needs to deliver with all due respect uh, to its independence. And if you have a look uh, at this uh, OECD uh, survey on the confidence in justice, one that was recently published, we see that uh, the Ukraine regrettably ranks the lowest among the OECD countries and OECD partner countries. So what is to be done now? Uh, on the one hand, uh, I would, I would uh, say that uh, it is not rocket science uh, what, what we have on the table here. We have uh, hundreds of reports. We have uh, international conventions like uh, the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, uh, where the Ukraine is also a member state to uh, Council of Europe, uh, some other uh, mechanisms were already mentioned. And uh, again, by summarizing some of the findings, and again, I do quote uh, from a recent OECD uh, report uh, where it reads, the next one, please, that Ukraine has, uh, on the one hand, adopted a comprehensive anti-corruption package of laws and established new specialized institutions like NABU, SAPO, uh, and, and other institutions. It definitely has achieved some levels of transparency by inter alia introducing the electronic asset uh, disclosure system, e-procurement, and some, some other um, mechanisms, and civil society more and more plays a significant role in pushing forward the reforms uh, and the international community supports that. On the other hand, we also do see, and again I quote, uh, that uh, we have not yet seen the firm establishment uh, on a steady path of anti-corruption reform, uh, even if it's certainly on the right trail. Political will by the highest echelons in the country is key, and uh, that at the moment uh, is being questioned, and I, uh, I have to agree to that as well. Um, and so it is time for Ukraine to take decisions and to, uh, to step forward in rooting uh, out pervasive corruption. Let me share a few final uh, understandings on those and how that might be done. First of all, we must avoid the mistake that uh, was also uh, seen in some other countries, uh, putting the entire responsibility uh, on one institution only. You know, 
I have been working also as the head of an anti-corruption commission for, for 10 years. And uh, we have seen it in too many countries, the next one please, in too many countries that we make one institution res responsible for social change. NABU is not going to change the Ukraine society or the overall situation. And so isn't SAPO and any other of, of the institution exclusively. If there is no collective action, if there is no uh, comprehensive approach, including the political will, they are not, not going to succeed. So as the way forward is concerned, and uh, with those uh, I might close then, let me outline the eight uh, following points. First of all, it is necessary to ensure, maintain, and empower the sustainability of already achieved uh, and notable uh, successes, the achievement of the institutional frameworks as well as the existing anti-corruption efforts and its momentum. We run the risk that this momentum might get lost. Second point, in particular, we need to further strengthen and empower the relevant actors in the field of law enforcement and criminal justice. And again, I need to echo what was said by Commissioner Hahn and some other ones. Uh, one cannot enough commend what was achieved by NABU uh, and to some extent also SAPO, so these institutions need to be supported. Thirdly, the implementation of uh, an anti-corruption high court also in my understanding is a conditio sine qua no. I do know that not many countries run such courts, but at the same time uh, we are, must also be aware that uh, there is no one sim singular formula for all countries uh, on this globe, but rather we need to adjust and need to uh, recognize specificities. Fourthly, we need to ensure the independence and effectiveness of all those institutions, bodies, and mechanisms. And again, there are also guidelines to that, be it the uh, European Partners Against Corruption guidelines, be it the Jakarta principles uh, and the UNDP and some other ones, the Paris principles, and so on. We also need to, uh, as a recommendation, uh, reconsider the current frameworks and settings of the National Agency on Prevention of Corruption, the NACP, uh, it is basically impossible to check every singular of the one million uh, e-declarations done a year, so we need to have proper mechanisms to uh, have a credible system of e-declarations and a body overseeing that. Sixthly, it is required to undertake a multidimensional approach to corruption carried by high-level political will, ownership and responsibility. Again, we have seen it too, in too many countries, at, and I'm not branding one or shaming one at that stage, but uh, that more or less the international donor community and international organizations are being made responsible for national development. To be very frank with you, if the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian uh, political sphere is not taking over this uh, responsibility, it is not going to happen. Seventhly, Strengthen consultations and coordination mechanisms among major external stakeholders. Also, that was referred to already by Commissioner Hahn, be it the European Commission, World Bank, IMF, or other stakeholders. And finally, also use and facilitate to a higher extent already existing institutions, tools, and mechanisms for capacity building and technical assistance, such as the advisory board, uh, also my organization, the European Partners Against Corruption Network, uh, or any other you name them, there are lots of those uh, that can be referred to. And eventually, uh, education and empowerment is uh, a major tool also in bringing those things forward. Uh, if we can um, also recall that that was inter alia acknowledged and recognized just last year again by the United Nations Human Rights Council, when not only was the negative impact of corruption on the enjoyment of human rights being outlined, but also that uh, the negative impact of cor corruption on human rights and sustainable development can be combated through anti-corruption education. If uh, my organization uh, can support that, we are at your disposal and uh, we are happy to contribute to that. Last but not least, can we have one more please? Last but not least, is the glass rather half full or is it half empty? 
I think what we have to accept is this is not a mission impossible. The glass is half full, but let's continue filling it up as uh, I think you can all agree with me. And with that, I conclude. Not only is it in the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, Goal 16, Bar 5, enshrined, but also I think you can uh, agree with me that corruption is the antithesis vis-à-vis -vis human rights, the venom vis-à-vis -vis the rule of law, the poison for prosperity and development, the reverse of equity and equality, and therefore investing in anti-corruption education and empowerment is the smart way towards sustainable development, safeguarding human rights, and strengthening the rule of law. And that does not only apply for the Ukraine or for the European Union. It actually applies for all of our countries. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Kreutner, and also uh, for sharing uh, your knowledge uh, so on the comparison where Ukraine stands, uh, so even compared uh, to neighbors uh, in uh, the European Union. I think it's uh, also uh, a so good uh, way to challenge uh, not only Ukrainians, but uh, also our EU uh, citizens and uh, politicians uh, to tackle uh, similar questions as uh, Ukrainians have to tackle. We continue uh, with uh, one of those uh, citizens uh, working in the city of Kharkiv uh, with uh, the uh, so center, Kharkiv Anti-Corruption Center. Uh, it's uh, Dimitri Bulak, uh, and uh, I'm happy that you made it uh, from uh, Kharkiv uh, to uh, Brussels today. Thank you, Pani Rebeko. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Rebecca, uh, thank you. I'm extremely grateful for the invitation to uh, present to you. Uh, yes, indeed, I would like to strengthen Mr. Martin's position that political will is a key factor in fighting corruption. Indeed, without political will, unfortunately, all uh, anti-corruption reforms is uh, questionable. Indeed, two Ukrainian revolutions of 2004 and 2014, to a large extent, were anti-corruption revolutions. And we see uh, from all polls and sociology that uh, the demand coming from the Ukrainian public after the reversion of dignity to fight corruption uh, was number one, became number one on the agenda for the first time in many years, as I believe so that uh, the Ukrainians demand what needs to be done. Uh, the Ukrainians identify the corruption in high echelons of uh, uh, authorities uh, as the major issue in their country as this demand, this request is our, our joint uh, effort, uh, a joint work of, of NGOs, civic societies, new anti-corruption institutions and agencies. Indeed, the uh, authorities, the establishment, whether they want it or not, they have to respond to this uh, request. Otherwise, they will cease to be. Uh, uh, will, uh, they will cease to be uh, political establishment because the Ukrainians will be making their choice in any of the future elections, uh, including also bearing in mind and uh, to what extent the previous establishment responded to the responded to anti-corruption. Uh, uh, Reforms and the Ukrainians, Ukrainian elections will make uh, electorate will make their choices on this basis. What is happening now? The fact is that, uh, irrespective of this huge demand coming from the society, we can say today we can say this is a step, certain step back uh, in the anti-corruption fight, uh, as already been mentioned a year ago. Uh, for example, they introduced uh, e-declaration for civic activists. Uh, uh, those who are engaged in anti-corruption, uh, fighting against corruption, that there were many promises uh, this e-declaration would be abolished. But uh, currently, today, it seems to me this is the very last day when the Ukrainian parliament is capable of uh, making this decision, which I doubt they will make today. And all uh, anti-corruption activists uh, will have to declare uh, the assets or they will be responsible, uh, punishable for failing to declare. Also, would like to say, irrespective, also irrespective of the demand to request coming from the public, from the society, still we witness, we evidence uh, physical assaults so on anti-corruption activists. Uh, myself, uh, last year, and my colleague Evgeny Lisichkin, there are some persecutions uh, uh, and by legal uh, procedures. Uh, uh, famous, a well-known 
they had uh, uh, anti-corruption, Ukrainian anti-corruption uh, organization Vitaly Shabunin is being persecuted uh, in criminal proceedings against him. These are assaults and uh, honest uh, judges like Larissa Holnik from Poltava region and others. In terms of, uh, as uh, m uh, Mr. McCullough mentioned, the introduction of anti-corruption infrastructure, uh, indeed the part of the anti-corruption infrastructure infrastructure fracture was implemented, uh, including NABU, SAP, uh, NASCO, but a very last step is uh, needed, and take corruption court. And we, as Ukrainians, could say a lot that we're establishing uh, infrastructures, but you know, uh, the we're trying to sell uh, to international partners and international community. We're trying to sell an excellent vehicle uh, with an excellent engine, uh, excellent design, but ha which has no uh, wheels. That's why we need to establish an anti-corruption infrastructure in such a way that it will, will not be doubtful by the international community or uh, citizens. And same polls actually prove that the trust of Ukrainian society to establishing anti-corruption court, they, um, they turn their uh, attention to international donors and to international organizations. They have the largest trust to them, but at least uh, trust is to the president, to the representatives of the Ukrainian authorities. Why is that? Because the Ukrainian uh, society, unfortunately, is disillusioned. They see who was fighting, trying to fight corruption in Ukraine, and those who are and, uh, failing to do that and who just pretending to be. In terms of the um, anti-corruption court, I must say that indeed the key uh, thing is the procedure of establishing it, is the subordination. And this is what our international partners demand and our uh, Ukrainian civic society demands. Uh, and I hope that all uh, Ukrainian politicians in Ukraine agreed to that for the uh, court to be established according to the recommendation of Venetian Commission. There's only one politician who doesn't agree to that yet. This is the president of Ukraine, but I do hope that he will join the, the others in that and he will help uh, establish the anti-corruption court, uh, uh, efficient and uh, mm, accusing the those who are guilty and rather not to have a, uh, a subordinate uh, uh, institution, subordinate to the president. I really hope and uh, believe that all of us in Ukraine will give a response to the demand, a request coming from our people to coming uh, from our people in Maidan in 2014. Many of them gave their lives to that, and it's our, it's our obligation uh, to them, uh, to their memories and to their uh, relatives to drag Ukraine from this uh, post-Soviet legacy and finally to end up, finish uh, this uh, uh, vicious circle and to fight corruption, as Artyom said, mentioned. Thank you. And uh, our last speaker in uh, this uh, round is uh, Eka. Uh, she is uh, well, well known, meanwhile, uh, in Ukraine and in the European Union because she is uh, leading the EU anti-corruption initiative uh, and so also is um, transferring a lot of uh, insights always from Kiev to Brussels. Please, Eka. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, our colleagues, friends, um, I'll try to be brief and complementing to what has been said as the speaker who is tasked to comment on what has been said already um, by, by the speakers of the panel. First uh, takeaway that has to be emphasized indeed is that when we speak about fight against corruption, we have to understand that in any country, and it is the case in Ukraine as well, fight against corruption cannot be compartmentalized. It's not an issue indeed of any given institution or any given sector of the development of the state, but it is an overarching theme of the state development as such. What is the type of the state that is being developed in any nation, state, and what are the state institutions based on which principles, values, and institutional mechanisms that are being developed, and how prevention of corruption to begin with is an overarching theme in it, and then how fight against corruption is a complementing element to the prevention. And if we would speak in a, in a nutshell, we speak about what needs to be done in any state so that corruption as such 
systemically is being prevented by the ways how regulations are changed, by the ways how institutions are being developed, by the way how decentralization in a comprehensive way is being achieved in terms of political setup of the state, but on the other hand, how impunity is being tackled. So that while stimulus, carrots, so to say, are being developed in the way how state could function in a non-corrupt and clean way, there is a predictability of responsibility rather than impunity being a predictability as a complement on the other hand to how developments are happening in any country. We have here our esteemed colleagues from Ukraine who are dealing on a daily basis with impunity related problems related in Ukraine and then successes that are being achieved there with the work of law enforcement bodies that have been created as the specialized agencies in this field. But then we all understand that holistic approach is needed and it is needed at every dimension that is needed to be tackled when we speak about transformation of Ukraine. And here, obviously, picture uh, as a takeaway if one would dig deeper of what happens in Ukraine is not black and white. It's much more nuanced and it's multi-layered indeed. Some of the achievements which are extremely important have already been mentioned in terms of institutional reforms that have taken place in Ukraine, but then significant challenges have been identified as well. And from the side of representative of one of the projects uh, that is implemented in Ukraine with the aim to assist our Ukrainian friends in, pro in, in pushing through the reform agenda in Ukraine is to develop specialized agencies working uh, in anti-corruption field. But at the same time, greater emphasis is being uh, directed at every other aspect that are related with transformation of Ukraine. And here I would want to uh, maybe uh, refer back to my own experiences back in my home country in Georgia when we've been assisted at the time as well in our transformational processes. What I see in Ukraine is an unprecedented level of coordination among international actors. And while I'm flattered to be, and my team to be mentioned by the commissioner with the efforts that we make in Ukraine uh, for the benefit of Ukraine, I have to emphasize that it's a teamwork in a very comprehensive way of all of our colleagues present in Ukraine and here in Brussels as well, because what is being done by the European Union in helping reforms in decentralization field, in energy sector, in development of administrative uh, arrangement of the state institutions in Ukraine, this is all anti-corruption related work ultimately, because as I've said, and I believe in it very firmly, fight against corruption per se cannot be compartmentalized and it needs to be indeed multidimensional and holistic in its approach. So a few themes that I would add then to what has been already mentioned related to extremely important issues like the development of anti-corruption court, uh, declarations related issues, not to, to use too much time on this because it was extremely well emphasized already by the speakers uh, here today. I would add the following additional themes uh, to, for consideration. Decentralization, I believe, is one of the uh, very important areas that is uh, right now undergoing in Ukraine. How this process will be accomplished, how proper arrangement of the local administrations will be developed so that we see that the cities in Ukraine, the local municipalities are becoming integral in their development, they are accountable, transparent, and at the same time introduce the regulations of the tithe and practices of serving the citizens that are conducive to economic development and social development of their communities so that we see more investments attracted to Ukraine, more developments, and we see that younger generation of Ukraine is enthusiastic about development of their lives in their own country with great creativity that they have rather than thinking how they could do it otherwise in, in other countries that could be more to the benefit of other countries than rather than to their own homeland. And this is, this is the hugely important task that is currently happening in Ukraine. Uh, opportunities are there, challenges as well, so it's obviously is the juncture in which we all have to be concentrated how developments could be uh, accomplished in, in this field. Uh, legislative processes, and uh, Martin, Mr. Kreutner mentioned today that he represents the advisory board that is being created for the benefit of assisting RADA in developing its own approach towards anti-corruption measures and approach in a systemic way how corruption risk assessments of draft legislations, by the way, have to be happening as well, because if we speak about systemic development of the country in this direction. It's not one single piece of legislation that 
by the name sounds as anti-corruption related legislation, but all reform related legislations that have to be assessed through the prism of corruption risks, whether or not the new initiatives are decreasing risks of corruption rather than perhaps increasing even without having any intention to do so. So systemic development of legislative processes in Parliament by the members of the Parliament as well as staff working in the legislature is an important element to the process which will bring results more in the midterm to the long term rather than short term perhaps right now in the electoral cycle. But this is an extremely important process to be uh, focused on. Finally, um, related, with relation to the societal approach, tolerance to the corruption, we haven't mentioned that uh, sufficiently enough, I guess. And if we would look to uh, the public opinion polls and how much public brings the anti-corruption as an issue at the top of the list of their concerns, there is a certain dichotomy if you dig deeper uh, while understanding that there is certain tolerance to corruption in the society as well. And this is a common effort among other efforts that need to be inclusive as the common effort by the civil society as much as the um, government, including local government as well in local municipalities that needs to be framed uh, as a collaborative effort to tackle the issue of tolerance towards corruption. But while having said so, I believe that success in this field can only be achieved if society is inspired, society which starts to believe that things can be done differently, even in your own country where you would believe that different ways of dealing with businesses, with government and expectations could not have been achieved and that is the pivotal moment in which through the inspiring examples like the development of NABU, for example, in this case, but finalization of those processes, extremely inspiring examples that could be achieved not only in the public procurement sector, but then generally in the fields that affect everyday life of the citizens. That's how the tolerance towards corruption could be tackled beyond the classics of the field in which one can raise it through the awareness and then dealing with the younger generation as well. So basically my main message is boils down to the few. It's the holistic approach that is needed by not compartmentalizing corruption in one field, in one sector only, but having it as an overarching theme that underpins the development of the country, establish collaborative mechanisms in which citizens could participate in the processes, having a confidence in the, in the processes raised through that, and in that respect, obviously, reversal of the requirement to file the declarations is an issue that can obstruct <coughs> more activism in this field rather than encourage, and we would all hope and believe that there will be proper uh, legislative measures undertaken to eliminate that obstacles uh, that uh, from, from the side of the for, or imposed now on the uh, civil society and then stimulating elements to the economic development which are about to be starting which is not only again public procurement but extremely important process of privatization doing it through transparent uh, processes related with Prozoro for example elimination of the reliance on the state-owned enterprises in this field, but rather going full-fledged to the market economy related uh, procedures in it, because ultimately it's democracy, social development, and economic development that glues it all together. And I think that by being part of the representative of the European Union team on the ground, I'm really pleased to mention once again that we feel that we are supported by our colleagues uh, here in Brussels. We, are, uh, we feel that we are supported among ourselves by feeling that we are part of the team with colleagues in other projects, and we feel that uh, we are um, used in a good way uh, by our Ukrainian uh, partners, which are trying to speed up our direction rather than being reluctant to undertake assistance that we are there to deliver <coughs> for them. And very final message, in an encouraging message, uh, based on the experience of the anti-corruption bodies in the way they have developed, if there is will and commitment, tailored and well-provided support for the technical development. It does not take decades for the institutions to emerge and develop, for them to become efficient and effective. It can be done in the limited time frames as well. There are many examples of that that we could see around the world, but in Ukraine already as well. So when we speak about high anti-corruption court for that matter, if the proper arrangements for the court will be made, I can assure as much as I can do on the personal level at least that it will not take 
10 years or 20 years for the court to be functional, but it can be done in a more limited time frame that could bring the potential of justice being delivered uh, uh, on the cases of high anti-corruption court, while the rest of the judicial reform would deal with the bigger issues of the rule of law that are essential, obviously, for the development of Ukraine. I thank you for your attention. Um, I'm sorry if I've been a bit long in it. Thank you. Thank you, Eka, and uh, also uh, from my side, because I follow your job. Uh, so it's, uh, um, it's always great uh, to see how much uh, you are dedicated uh, to this task now outside of your um, country, Georgia, now in, in Ukraine. Uh, always a pleasure to listen to you and also to see the results uh, of your work. Um, I think um, this is uh, one of uh, the issues uh, you mentioned last, what is uh, important to know. So if everybody would have the will, the high anti-corruption court uh, could start to work in uh, 2019, as I understand it. And uh, this would be uh, also for Ukrainian citizens uh, in the country, uh, so a good orientation, and they need uh, positive orientations. Um, what I have um, now on my list uh, for the last uh, 30 minutes, uh, so in uh, this uh, session, um, is uh, the request of the colleagues uh, from uh, the uh, delegation, the Ukraine delegation. We have several members of parliament here. I would propose to start with Mr. Gala, who is also the standing rapporteur um, on uh, Ukraine in AFID committee, and then uh, I would give the floor uh, to Mr. Boni, Mr. Chani, and Mr. Demesmaker. Um, and um, please keep it uh, short so that uh, others uh, can uh, also uh, join the discussion, and we have possibilities to uh, give you answers. Uh, thank you very much, and many thanks to all uh, from, from Ukraine, in Ukraine, and from Brussels here. Uh, from all angles, sincere thanks to all these concerted efforts to, to get things going or continuing uh, to, to improve. Uh, I think it's an excellent job that is being done with high technical, political, and personal motivation. So that cannot be enough uh, estimated. Um, my question goes, uh, first of all, on the timeline for a possible uh, finalization of the second reading of the anti-corruption law, uh, court uh, legislation. I mean, I hear the, uh, the, the deficits that have been identified will be met, uh, but when will it pass the Verhofna Rada? Is there any indication and is anybody pushing that um, in a proper way uh, with regard to the specific issue of uh, the selection process uh, for those who, who are then finally entitled is there now an agreement how that the, the criteria uh, are a bit uh, broader uh, or not so, um, not so limiting de facto but uh, allowing more people? And uh, it, will it be a two-way process to have the, the pre-selection with the international experts with a veto perhaps or with the pre-selection and then going for the final vote uh, of those uh, then uh, on the Ukrainian side? And uh, that is the one issue. The other issue that interests me, uh, it was said that the, uh, there will probably not be a possibility prior to the 1st of April to, to abolish this obligation for the NGOs. I mean, we were promised, uh, Rebecca, when we were the, in the 8th of January in the yes. presidential administration, they promised us not to activate it for them. So that has to be either formally done, and if not, then we would hope that in this case the law would not be applied, or what is the alternative? So where do we stand? And the last uh, point, uh, because of the decentralization, a lot of money is now available on the oblast level further downwards. Are there any experiences already existing uh, in what way the money is best spent? Is it better to, to administer it from the oblast level uh, because they don't consider the villages and towns to be able to absorb it, or is it better to give it really down on the local level because they know best how to use it? Are there any, perhaps in one oblast it's better on this level and the other it's better to pass it on? Is there anything available? Thank you. Michael. Thank you very much, and uh, also I want to thanks to all panelists, to all speakers for uh, excellent presentations and very inspiring uh, suggestions uh, and recommendations for the future. Uh, through many months, uh, I have presented the view that uh, Ukraine uh, requires reforms, 
and that uh, it is uh, obvious that we need to give the time for those reforms, especially because this is the war in uh, the east part of Ukraine, annexation of Crimea, very, very and many difficult uh, issues. But now I would like to say that uh, uh, I think that we achieved the critical point when we are talking about corruption, and I think that we need to go forward with better understanding of those uh, problems. Because uh, when we are talking about anti-corruption special code, high anti-corruption code, we are talking many months, we are discussing many months. When we are talking about NGOs and uh, e-declaration, we are discussing many, many months, and we have had many promises from the authorities from the Ukraine to solve the problem. Now this is a new exemption in the e-declaration system, and it is not clear what is the background for, for, for this exemption. And it is, of course, clear for all of us that if we are talking about future development, uh, corruption is stopping future investment, processes of privatization, uh, uh, many, many issues, and first of all is uh, killing the social uh, confidence, social capital, is killing the trust. Trust is one of the hard factor when we are talking about development. So we need to go forward, and my view is that we need to understand that fight against anti-corruption should be driven not by words and declarations, but uh, by concrete actions, full implementation of proper legislation, proper law, and of course blocking uh, 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 blocks of ecosystem, as it was mentioned, ownership, political will, which is crucial, and responsibility. This is the ecosystem, and we need to discuss how to implement this ecosystem, not to discuss only about some particular issues, because we are focusing from time to time on, uh, on this court, yes, but, but uh, uh, not remembering about uh, uh, additional issues. So my uh, question is, if we are ready to make the real roadmap for anti-corruption, a uh, comprehensive, uh, uh, holistic approach and implementation with timetable. Uh, 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 secondly, I want to, to ask uh, uh, Darek Rosati if we, during the PIC uh, in April, uh, uh, should take uh, uh, the point in our agenda and discuss about of this possible roadmap for anti-corruption uh, anti uh, roadmap. And uh, uh, I think that this kind of panel, exchange of you, also should be organized with all of us uh, and with invitation of additional people in Kiev. And it should be uh, uh, very, very, uh, it should be organized in this way with a vocal and a strong message to, uh, to the public. From my point of view, it is to be or not to be for the future development of Ukraine. And I'm sorry because at 9, at 11.20, I will have a very important meeting, so I, I, I will have to leave. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, um, uh, as a matter of fact, you know, from time to time, uh, we normally hear uh, certain reports uh, uh, from uh, Ukraine uh, about the development uh, of, uh, of uh, the fight uh, against uh, uh, corruption. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm, well, okay, yes, uh, I'm welcoming any steps uh, which, which has been uh, taken. Uh, however, there was a very, one very, very interesting thing what Mr. Kreutner said a couple of minutes ago, namely that uh, single institutions, single acts uh, cannot be a game changer in themselves or in itself. Uh, you need to have a much broader cooperation of the uh, society. And, uh, and, and I'm, 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 I'm just wondering that a part of, 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 of those uh, legal uh, actions uh, or, or steps which were outlined or already taken. Uh, uh, how do you perceive? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, how the public life is 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 uh, now dealing with uh, corruption? Um, is there any improvement in in a sense that that, that that people are more and more and more angry against it, or or is it just the day-to-day -day business or business as usual? Uh, so I, I would like to, to, to know a little bit more about uh, the mental 
uh, uh, part of the, of, of, of the case, you know, because uh, we have seen in this respect good examples and bad examples. Also within the European Union, uh, there are countries, including uh, one which I know best, uh, namely where uh, corruption uh, is, has, has been expanded in the, in the couple of past years, and, and this, but, but people just slowly, slowly get accustomed and, and even scandals do not uh, touch them. Uh, but, but, but this flow uh, can, can, can be reversed and, and, and it, it may work vice versa. Uh, if, if, if you promote uh, the anti-corruption idea, anti-corruption fight uh, in, in, in the country. So, um, uh, basically, I would like to know a little bit more about the public perception of, 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 of the whole case. Thank you. Mark, please. Uh, thank you. Well, I can agree with what most of my colleagues uh, have said. Um, we're all politicians, and we are all running out of time. Um, we will have elections next year as well here in, in, in the European Union for, for this parliament and Ukraine has uh, got a lot of support already, uh, also important financial support and it will need it in the future. And therefore we need our colleagues, be it in the Governorate, in the presidential office or the different departments in Ukraine to help us as well because we will go to the voters next year and we will have to show that it was worthwhile. They will tell me, uh, Mark, you were at Maidan. You were on the stage there. You defended uh, Ukraine all the way through. And what is the result? So we need this keystone to be, to be built. Without a keystone, the house collapses. So we need the, the court to be established and working as soon as possible. So the timeline indeed uh, is uh, very Im important. It, it, it has to be um, not a blurry court, with, a court with independent uh, judges, and there should be the political will indeed to establish that. And this is a call. It's a call <laughs> to, to my colleagues um, in Ukraine to help us here as well, to keep on doing our job. We like to do that. We, like to, we want to support, uh, and we, will, we want to continue to support. But we need your help to establish and to deliver uh, the results. Yes, there are changes. Yes, uh, we see uh, progress. But the question is, will it be enough to convince also our public opinion? That is my message. Thank you, Mark. I would uh, now uh, like uh, to invite uh, to answer some of the questions also uh, Mr. Ser Seryogin, uh, because he represents uh, the National Agency on uh, Corruption Prevention, so the other institution uh, mainly uh, responsible to deal with the big data of uh, e-declarations. Um, and maybe also uh, you uh, try to answer why it was suddenly necessary to include uh, NGOs uh, in the need uh, of uh, declaring their uh, big assets. Uh, so people who normally are not uh, seen as uh, hiding uh, big assets. Please. Thank you, Pani Golovuyucha. Thank you, Chair. I'd, in order not not uh, to be uh, uh, too too long, I'd like to say that this is a unique. Uh, uh, chance that we have today because we have a good uh, many uh, representatives uh, uh, of Ukrainian anti-corruption uh, by the, the, the NABU, the prosecutor's office, etc. Et in uh, I uh, represent an institution uh, which uh, tries to prevent uh, corruption. And uh, I'd like to underline the fact, uh, uh, answering uh, one of the questions, in the uh, there, uh, there are over two million uh, documents uh, as far as the e declaration index is, is concerned. Uh, we have an incredible uh, number of documents. I don't think that there is an, an analog uh, anywhere in, in, in the world. Every minute we receive 120 e uh, declarations. We are working in in a 
Peak uh, regime uh, for this period in time, uh, the 2.2 million declarations uh, are not the end. Uh, between now and April uh, 1st, we're going to get 700,000 further uh, e-declarations. I think that we have a, a fairly effective uh, system of uh, corruption pre prevention according to European standards. Uh, at this point in time, the comments that we have gotten from Greco, from uh, uh, the OECD, all of these have been factored in uh, in our February report, we uh, have uh, we said that we uh, have an effective system of uh, fighting uh, corruption. In terms of uh, public uh, uh, law, in uh, uh, in our agency, we can, we can say that that, that uh, many of these uh, in instances have programs. <coughs> we have also uh, a formation for uh, uh, uh for state officials, uh, we have a, a chat bond, uh, uh, that uh, helps uh, people solve uh, their difficulties. A great n number uh, of actions will be possible if uh, we are able to do the analysis of these 2.2 million e-declarations automatically. At this uh, point in time, we have only 46 people working uh, with this great number of declarations. Uh, this is uh, the, the maximum number of, of employees that we can have. Despite the fact of a very uh, low uh, number of uh, workers uh, and and the fact that we don't have uh, uh, a possibility to do this uh, uh, automatically, we have been able to transfer to NABU uh, eight different cases of uh, cor corruption. Uh, uh, which uh, are uh, criminal in uh, nature. The, diffic the difficulty uh, is also uh, a question of lack of interoperability with uh, other uh, uh, with other instances. Uh, but moreover, we cannot join um, databases that have the same level uh, of protection that we do. These are all uh, technical uh, problems, and uh, we cannot solve these technical problems by uh, legal uh, means. We are working on uh, this. Uh, we have uh, an action plan that has been uh, uh, confirmed by uh, the cabinet of, of ministers. We have a timeline of what we need to do uh, every month. This is the first time uh, that this kind of thing uh, has uh, been confirmed. In, indeed, uh, our foreign uh, partners are more concentrated on NABU, which is uh, uh, fighting against corruption in a very direct uh, fashion. But I think it's important also uh, to have an effective system of prevention because that is uh, that is going to help uh, the total uh, picture. As far as the NGO uh, that you have uh, uh, mentioned, you know that there is uh, a law, and as long as the Verkhovna uh, Rada has not uh, modified uh, this piece of le uh, le legislation, uh, uh, the NGOs have to uh, submit their declarations. We understand uh, the problem in question, and we will try to have a, a, a well-balanced uh, approach to this question. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, your uh, statement. I think uh, for those who are not aware of this, uh, so the lack of uh, uh, so achievements uh, in uh, your institution 
Um, so led also to the decision to postpone uh, the macrofinancial assistance uh, tranche uh, last year. Uh, so uh, we are very interested uh, on the EU level uh, that the e-declaration uh, will, will, uh, system will work. It's not the case that we have no interest, but uh, we have uh, interest in uh, progress. Yeah? Um, so I have uh, collected several um, uh, questions to uh, the panelists, and I would ask everybody uh, to, uh, to take the floor. I saw uh, already um, so that um, Mr. Kolodnitsky was ready to answer uh, on the uh, timetable for the anti-corruption court. Maybe uh, you can uh, take this also for your, can use this answer for your final remarks as everybody else. Mm -hmm. And I think not everybody has uh, to answer all the questions raised. Please start, Mr. Kolodnitsky. Thank you very much. So regarding the scheduling, how fast we can proceed with the establishment of the anti-corruption court of Ukraine, I can only say what our parliamentarians say. Uh, the first deadline was uh, end of March and the process is ongoing. Uh, there are very certain applications um, uh, that this law will be adopted and we hope that until May of this current year, um, inclusive of the amendments that will be submitted, uh, uh, it, it, the law can be uh, adopted. The question is not when the, we will schedule the adaptation of the law. The question is that this High Court has to function and to perform its uh, functions. Uh, the reality of the Ukrainian life and uh, what is being discussed and is being written on paper can differ because uh, after a legal act, uh, we start the proceedings for material um, uh, services for material um, uh, for material uh, provision uh, for such an office. Uh, uh, we have to uh, uh, open a tender to attract a specialist who would chair um, this authority. <laughs> I, I would like to give you certain examples. Uh, uh, we have conducted uh, for the public anti-corruption prosecutor's office uh, uh, an open tender. Out of 350 uh, applicants, we uh, had seven vacancies and only four candidates were selected. So y you can imagine how much effort and how much dedication we had to devote to this process. Um, I very much hope that by the end of the current year or next year, we will be able to really establish uh, the high anti-corruption court. And I do hope that this court will start working uh, in uh, February, March 2019. Obviously, I also don't like this deadline, but I have uh, experience in act anti-corruption activities, uh, the practice of this activity, and I can only say that uh, there is hardly possible to speed up this process. Thank you. I believe that the question number one now is uh, to remove the critique uh, that uh, was um, uh, mentioned. Uh, obviously, the parliamentary proceedings can last a long period of time. And I believe there are, uh, will be some formal complaints that will be submitted. Uh, however, uh, pertaining to the requirements uh, for the candidates and the competences of this court. I would like to say that if we will not be able to eliminate these uh, 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 said, uh, critical suggestions and uh, accommodate uh, uh, the requirements that are needed to be accommodated, I have received uh, opinions uh, from the civil societies, from the international community, from other sources, and, and these conclusions uh, 
are very similar uh, that we have to avoid pitfalls and mistakes that others made and have to elaborate a more comprehensive procedure. The procedure uh, of the selection of judges and the participation of international experts in this procedure are vital. I believe that without uh, avoiding those mistakes that were already mentioned and were already in critique, uh, there is no sense uh, in establishing of the high anti-corruption court. NABU is a large structure with over 700 employees, uh, and uh, and we were able we were we we had to process around 25,000 applications, so you can imagine uh, that um, the structure of the high anti-corruption court can be established faster than a large structure um, as a NABU. <coughs> I have al already mentioned that the quality of the legislative process, the velocity at which we will uh, will be able to establish uh, this institution, uh, political will that has been mentioned today many times, are all important uh, components and prerequisites for the success uh, of the venture. I believe that there will be attempts at fraud um, because uh, international partners uh, I consulted with have pointed out to these threats and now is the time to discuss uh, this, uh, the establishment of this institution <coughs> and I agree with Nazar that by uh, February 2019 approximately we can aim uh, that this institution will be established and will start to handle criminal cases and pass verdicts. And I think uh, somebody should also answer the question on the possibilities of decentralization. Um, on decentralization, I'll start with that. Um, as you know, uh, the, the process is indeed very comprehensive. It relates to not only at the level of the large regional centers like Oblast, but then amalgamation of the very small local communities as well. And indeed, uh, financial independence and responsibility, which is I mean, added to that obviously as well, is an uh, important element to the process. I've traveled quite a lot in the regions of Ukraine recently, and it's interesting to observe the very interesting examples that are emerging in different cities and different communities in this regard. It's a process uh, that is a learning process for many of them because it's the first time in which they are getting responsible about having finances and then spending it in an appropriate way. So the primary directions indeed uh, for, for us to be assisting them as well is how to get the budgetary processes right so that they are open, they are inclusive, and then how the monitoring of the processes are being maintained, how the uh, acquiring of the services uh, to the citizens through the um, Prozoro system is done properly by the local administrations, but then how the sales and leasing of the state properties as well, how the open hearings and inclusiveness of the local societies are being part of it as well. In overall, not to take too much time on that, I think the, the way how it, it develops in Ukraine is not differentiating in a very substantial way between the sizes of the communities in that way, but rather finding the formulas in which how through amalgamation, smaller ones could become more efficient while dealing with the financial issues. But this independence is key for them to become more accountable and responsive as well to their local communities, because the argument that you would have done something, but you are not able because somebody somewhere is not giving you the opportunity to do so is not merited anymore. And uh, finally, just very, very uh, little remark on um, the court. I fully agree with this message that it is the symbol as well in its own way as well. What is the determination for the future in terms of dealing with corruption in the country? Because by accepting the proper 
development of the court, it sends the powerful signal that there is this determination that profound change will have to happen from the time when the court emerges. And in terms of timelines, no predictability there, but what can be said on, from the side of international community, the offer has made, uh, been made clear and uh, to Ukrainian authorities that in terms of expertise that could be needed in this direction from all stakeholders, including Council of Europe, European Union, member states, as much as uh, American uh, development uh, programs as well, technical assistance could be provided in the process if there will be momentum for that, so that all the assistance that will be needed as much as it was the case in the development of NABU, in the development of SAPO and other institutions, it can be well mobilized, it can be targeted and provided in, in, in the way that could be of benefit uh, to Ukraine. Um, and the 1st of April, uh, uh, it's, it's very little time, obviously, that is left there. There are some uh, talks about potential of postponing the deadline in itself. It's not the final solution of the issue, obviously, but we're very watchful to what is to have to what is about to happen this week, and by that, to see what is the uh, play field for our <laughs> colleagues, courageous representatives of civil society, for them to be full-fledged part of the development processes or being impeded in a way how these requirements could create impediments for them, especially in the regions and in the small communities where uh, hardship for anti-corruption-related activism is higher than in the bigger cities and in the bigger communities. So the concerns from the colleagues who are working in the regions are much stronger in the way how this application could be of impediment to them rather than even in the big cities and then within the bigger organizations that can deal in a different way with the challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Eka, and uh, also uh, for uh, reminding us uh, that uh, we are, should not always only look to Kiev uh, with our activities, but uh, should, uh, should look uh, much beyond uh, Kiev and what's going on positively uh, in the regions, but also what are the specific uh, threats. Um, I would like uh, to give the floor now for some concluding remarks to Mr. Kreutner. Thank you very much, Madam Chairperson. Uh, three, three issues. First of all, as far as the anti-corruption court is con uh, con uh, concerned, very brief. Yes, it needs to be established for a simple reason. First of all, that we show that we deliver. And secondly, to close the link uh, that there is obviously uh, in the judicial system. As far as the question uh, was concerned uh, on the single institution, single institution is a game changer. You know, uh, we have it in the United Nations Convention, we have it in the OECD conventions, we have it in the Council of Europe conventions that there is a key element for anti-corruption bodies and that is independence. Yes, independence is key. However, what we also see is that this notion is being backfiring, interestingly, because now we make those institutions exclusively responsible for bringing social change and that is not going to work. If we accept that, they are the predetermined breaking point the predetermined breaking point because then we have established somebody that we can make responsible if something goes wrong. And that was not the intention of the, of the singer to hope so. That was also the reason why I was calling in, in my recommendations for this uh, very clear message. We need to go the multidimensional approach and we need to accept that there are responsibilities by the end of the day, responsibilities that start at the political level and go down uh, to the lowest level. As far as uh, the question of public perception is concerned, uh, and here I would not like to oversimplify things or go too deep into issues of sociology, but it brings us back to what Ecker was referring uh, when, he's, when she talked about the dichotomy of, uh, on the one hand, and we see this to some extent also in the, in the corruption perception index. If there are reforms, people have expectations. And if we do not fulfill those expectations, people might fall back in the most comfortable survival mode. And if that includes corruption, because everybody is engaged in it, yes, that's the case. So there is the requirement and the respons responsibility again to deliver, to deliver. If we do not deliver, we have this, uh, this fallback and we have this slashback again uh, into the most comfortable ways people again also having a more tunnel view and uh, limiting themselves to the most immediate micro-sociological aspects and not seeing the common good, the macroecological perspective. So there is no alternative to delivering. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Kreutner, and uh, the concluding remarks for this uh, panelists' round is uh, to Thank you, Ambassador. Rebecca, very shortly, just uh, yes, to confirm what it was already said by uh, ECA on the decentralization issue. It's really, uh, really, we have uh, some kind of success in, in financial decentralization and, and uh, amalgamation of the communities. But the next step, what we will need uh, together with the whole society, uh, is to, to have a better capacity building in the regions, in the uh, local authority communities education, better management, because, you know, with the new situation, with the uh, financial decentralization, the people must know how to deal with the money and how to prepare some kind of what should be the first, education, uh, I don't know, um, medicine, uh, etc. And just to confirm what it was said already by uh, Mr. Holodnitsky uh, about the timeline for, for the uh, anti-corruption court. Uh, we hope to have as soon as possible, but uh, it seems to be that at the end to, to may have a, a result. And all, and especially because of some uh, kind of many uh, amendments which appear on, on, a, on a parliament. Hopefully, uh, we will have a, such a, a good result. And I don't think that at Metro uh, somebody uh, now is against of such a precedent process, especially I'm talking about President. He proposed a, a draft of law, and now it's for for whole, uh, you know, society and our parliamentarian to work together. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mikola. And uh, so uh, to add something uh, to the wish list, uh, which has been uh, presented uh, today a bit uh, during this panel, I would like to mention the reform of uh, the electoral law. Uh, I think uh, it would be also a major contribution if uh, this uh, reform uh, would be done uh, as soon as possible. Um, we are asking uh, for this and are supporting it with our discussions uh, since long. I have to thank uh, all the participants of this panel. I hand now uh, over uh, to my colleague uh, Dario Rosati. He will deal uh, with uh, the difficult issue of uh, reforms in the energy sector. And uh, I think it's a very timely discussion uh, because uh, our role uh, in Brussels is right now also uh, to strengthen uh, Naftogas in the new battle uh, with uh, Gazprom, which we are facing uh, since uh, some uh, time again. And um, yeah, uh, the better uh, the reforms work, uh, the stronger we will be together. So thank you for your attention and a big applause to all the participants of the panel. Thank you, Rebecca, and uh, uh, I join you in uh, thanking the, the speakers uh, of the pre previous panel, a very interesting discussion, and uh, certainly uh, uh, we have now a much better idea of what's going on and uh, what will happen in the future. Now we move on to the second panel, <coughs> and the second panel is about, uh, uh, about the situation uh, in the most strategic sector of the Ukraine economy, this is the energy sector, in which uh, also uh, and there is a long history of corruption, <coughs> uh, but also uh, there is also a long history of inefficiencies and, uh, and uh, mismanagement. Uh, so we uh, would like now to ask our two panelists, uh, which, who are with us, uh, almost ready to sit uh, behind the uh, podium and, uh, and speak. So uh, the first speaker is uh, Mrs. Olena Osmowska, head of the corporate communication of Naftogaz. Uh, Ms. Osmowska, I give you the floor for 10 minutes, please. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for organizing this event, and we would like to thank um, Ms. Harms and uh, Mr. Rosati for organizing this. And, uh, paying attention and bringing uh, to the focus the, uh, the fight we now have with corruption in Ukraine. It's very critical that we uh, retain this support from, from our European partners, and we are very thankful to you for this. I would like to give a very brief account of uh, what happened uh, with Nafta Gas in the past four years. I also have a very short presentation, and uh, I wonder if we can try to put this on screen again.
it's a little bit of a logistical challenge, but I hope the, uh, uh, the gentleman behind the screen is finished with the coffee break. Just uh, as, as a brief introduction, uh, in 2014, when our team came to Naftagas, this was briefly after Maidan, like a couple of weeks after it ended. Uh, at that time, Naftagas was known as a black hole of Ukrainian budget. It was uh, the name which was, which was very closely associated with corruption in the state level, in the energy sector. And uh, in the past several years, we were able to turn it from uh, the black hole to the largest contributor of the state budget. Can I, can I uh, ask someone to uh, take care of this computer and uh, put the presentation on? <coughs> yeah? He's calling. Ah, he's calling. Again. Here we go. Okay, Can we please go to slide one, slide two? Yeah. Um, some, some figures to illustrate the, the dire situation in which the company uh, found itself in 2014. We were very much indebted to Gazprom and to other creditors. We had 8.7 billion in payable uh, amounts in the, in the coming 12 months. We had uh, severe difficulties in collecting cash from our clients. We, uh, we had 3.3 billion of uh, dollars in arrears. Uh, by that time, we did not have uh, access to uh, sufficient volumes of gas. Our storages were empty, and uh, we relied on imported gas by 60% of our consumption in the country. And our only uh, uh, provider of imported gas was uh, Gazprom at that time. Uh, and there was another severe, severe implication is that our gas, which uh, Naftagas produced, was sold to uh, households uh, and to other clients at the price uh, of, uh, which was 15% of the market price. So this situation seemed hopeless. I mean, Naftagas is in debt, Naftagas doesn't have the gas, Naftagas needs to do a lot of things to survive and stay afloat. Uh, could I ask you to turn to the next slide? How come that we happen to be in this situation? This is a very critical uh, uh, ideological, if you wish, uh, uh, reason behind the uh, corruption and the uh, poor state of, uh, of our finances by that time. There was what we call vicious circle of Russian gas in Ukraine, which involved a lot of corrupt activities. The, how, how it uh, worked, uh, Russia supported Ukrainian politicians historically who were uh, providing for two things to happen. First of all, the gas prices for households were kept below the market, severely be below the market. And second one is that they have uh, uh, jeopardized any efforts to diversify supplies of imported gas to Ukraine. This led to several consequences. Number two is that uh, consumption is in Ukraine was extremely inefficient. You do not need to save gas if it doesn't cost any, anything. Second application of that, to balance the, uh, the payments, uh, Ukrainian gas was, uh, Ukrainian gas producer, producing company was forced to, p to sell its gas at a very extremely low price, which was uh, barely covering the operating cost, which meant that we could not invest into gas production, which meant that it decreased. And uh, the next implication of this situation is that Ukraine needed a lot of imported gas. Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's own production was falling, and that uh, br brought us to, uh, to the need to import a lot of gas from Gazprom from Russia. Uh, in this situation, Russia and Gazprom were able to, uh, to charge us barely any prices they would like, we were forced to sign very inefficient, very, very disadvantageous contracts in 2009. And uh, that led Ukrainian politicians to the need to come to, uh, to Russia, to Gazprom, and beg for some concessions, for some discounts to make the finances somehow work together. Which in turn led to uh, uh, Russia's ability to enforce some uh, uh, political agenda uh, to require that Ukraine does not integrate with the U European Union, that we integrate with the customs uh, union which they have uh, initiated. 
in, in this manner, they have received a lot of uh, benefits from the Ukrainian situation, and they had the means to affect the Ukrainian politicians, which were launching the cycle all over again. They were not doing the reform. They were not diversifying supplies. They were virtually killing the local production. So what happened in 2014? If I may, I ask you to, uh, to switch to slide five. Next one. Uh, here are the results of Naftogaz turnaround in the past four years. We turned from a company which was losing money to a company which is making money. We lost uh, about 88 billion uh, grivna in uh, 2014. We were the, mo the, the most loss-making company not only in Ukraine, but I can bet also in the, uh, in the Central and Eastern Europe uh, uh, at least. Uh, in 2016, we posted uh, a profit of almost $1 billion, and in, uh, in the nine months of 2017, the most recent data, it's already 27 billion grivna, which is uh, um, almost $1 billion. Uh, we also fixed our uh, liquidity situation. We, uh, we were in need of uh, 60 billion grivna in 2014, which was financed by the government with the help of the IMF. And uh, now in Naftogaz's cash making, we are, uh, we are paying, uh, we are the largest dividend payer to the, to the government. We are the largest taxpayer to the state budget. We account for 14% of uh, state budget revenue. Next slide, please. Uh, what happened in uh, Naftagaz uh, relations with Russia and Gazprom? We used to be uh, a huge import, net importer of uh, Ukrainian economy. We, were, we would have to pay a lot of money to Gazprom to pay for gas. We were providing also the uh, gas transit services, but these services were not covering our spending for imported gas. What happened in the recent years is that we are now not importing gas from Gazprom at all. We have uh, s significantly cut consumption in Ukraine and the need for imports, and we have diversified our supplies of imported gas, which helped us to bring the prices down to a uh, fair market level. If we look at specific, our specific relations with, with Gazprom, in 2014, we owed them almost $3 billion. And now, after the completion of two Stockholm arbitration cases, they owe us almost $3 billion. So this is the, uh, the example of how a holistic approach to anti-corruption and reform efforts can give results and, uh, and, and, and uh, provide for some uh, significant achievement. Um, how did we do this? We have broken the vicious cycle of the Russian gas in Ukraine. We have started with uh, diversifying imports. We have opened interconnectors with the uh, uh, Western Europe with the huge support of the European Commission of the, uh, or our financing partners of the European Parliament, and we are very, very much grateful for them. Um, we have achieved independence from Russia in gas issues, and we were able to launch the revision of the unfair contracts and very disadvantageous contracts, uh, uh, in, uh, which were concluded under pressure in 2009. Uh, why this was important is that be, because uh, the uh, arbitration process lasts for so long, for three, it took us three and a half years to uh, get the awards. Uh, it means that if we were not able to survive, to survive the winters, if we did not have any other choices of gas supply, we would not be able to uh, sustain the cases for so long. Uh, the second step in the reform was market liberalization. Previously, in 2014, Naftagaz was responsible for virtually any uh, consumption. Like, whoever wanted gas and did not have a supplier, they would be charged to Naftagaz. That created huge losses for the company. Uh, the company was not working hard on collecting debts because some of these suppliers were connected to uh, the powerful, uh, to the parties in power at the time. What happened uh, in 2015, the Ukrainian parliament has voted for a European uh, um, efficient, very, very modern law on uh, gas, uh, natural gas market in Ukraine. And that has uh, removed a lot of uh, disadvantages and, and, and a lot of inefficiencies in the, in the way Ukrainian gas market operated. We can say that in the commercial segment of the market, Naftagaz now accounts only for less than 5% of supply. We have uh, several hundreds of uh, gas traders in Ukraine, including the uh, uh, such large Western names like Trafigura, like NG, like RWE. They are competing with each other for customers in the commercial segment, and that brings uh, the prices to the lowest level possible. 
Um, the uh, additional, the other steps which, which were done by Ukrainian government is the pricing reform in household segment. The prices were brought significantly up to reflect the market level, uh, the cost of, of gas in Ukraine. They are still not liberalized, they are still not at the level of uh, import uh, parity. However, they are now no longer 85% discount, we are talking about 25 to 30% discount to the market price. What, uh, what was the result of this move? People started to save. People started to use gas more efficiently and to care how much they uh, how much gas they spend because it reflects on their payments. Okay. Um, so we uh, we were able to cut down the Ukraine's need on uh, of gas. And finally, the uh, last but not least uh, component of this fight was corporate governance reform. You, uh, with the help of the EBRD and uh, all the European and Western partners, uh, Naftagas is the uh, first case of the state-owned company where the modern uh, corporate uh, governance system is being introduced. We now have our uh, independent supervisory board, which consists of very strong individuals, like the head of the board is a uh, former uh, regulator of the British uh, gas market, Claire Spottiswood, and uh, there are other uh, high-ranking uh, people on the board. What uh, next step, what we still lack, is, the, is to empower this board and to make sure that it uh, has the ability to make decisions. Uh, can we turn? Turn back to the previous slide, please. Yep. Why I'm talking so much about this is we, we had a lot of discussion here about how to fight corruption uh, through NABU, through SAP, and through uh, other um, institutions. Uh, but uh, the point is these institutions, they prosecute corruption. What, uh, what is necessary for, uh, for success in, the, in this work is to prevent corruption. And in introducing a modern corporate governance system in Ukrainian state-owned company is a key element to this corruption fight. This is what we uh, also try to pursue and to, uh, to implement in Naftagas, because our successes show that Ukraine can grow, Ukraine can expire and achieve uh, amazing results. From hopeless situations, we are able to, uh, to get to uh, victories, but we need to, uh, to do the hard work, we need to uh, have this holistic approach, and we need to build on our uh, civil society to achieve these successes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Thorsten Wöller, team leader, support group of, for Ukraine, European Commission. For 10 minutes, please. Yes, thank you. I, I will try to stick to the 10 minutes. Uh, thank you very much for inviting and uh, also for, for putting energy uh, on the agenda because I think energy is a very good uh, test for progress in real life because energy uh, has been probably one of the most intense sources of corruption in Ukraine in the past. And we can also see there that there's a direct threat to, to national security. Corruption leads to a loss of sovereignty and, and of national security. And the Naftogaz presentation is very telling on this. Uh, so it's not only human development, but it's really very, very basic. Um, Naftogaz is, of course, a very good example. We have now also other examples where things are moving ahead. For instance, uh, the state-owned uh, company uh, which manages the electricity grids, Ukrenergo, they have now managed also through uh, Pozoro and, and procurement uh, procedures which are more transparent to lower the cost uh, of, for instance, transformer stations uh, by two-thirds. So now they cost only, let's say, one-third of what they used to have. Uh, the question was, is the, is the glass half empty or half full? And it, it, everywhere it's a mixed picture, so it's really a very dynamic process. Another example for state-owned uh, companies in the energy sector where you don't have so much progress is, for instance, Centre Energo, which are still accumulating new debt which has usually, usually been uh, used as a tool to prevent transparent privatizations. So the mechanism is very simple. Uh, the one who holds the debt has, a, let's say, a very big advantage if privatization uh, arrives, and uh, that keeps uh, other partners, other people interested in privatization at bay. Um, there were a number of loopholes for corruption which have been closed by the government over the last three, four years. One was already mentioned, it was the artificially low energy pricing. Uh, and just, I remember when I uh, started uh, four years ago to look into this, there were 11 different prices for each molecule of gas. 
uh, and the gas was usually not really metered, so it was very difficult to tell who is using what. And this was part of the business model of uh, Mr. Firtas, who essentially uh, controlled the supplies to the population, which many of them received very, very lo low prices. But on the other hand, he also controlled much of Ukraine's chemical industry, especially fertilizer plants, who normally should have paid a higher price. But, and because it was meet, not metered, he managed to be super profitable, uh, and he also controlled the, the gas imports uh, uh, via uh, Ros Ukrainergo, etc. So uh, the, the whole sector was very, very much captured. Uh, and uh, another loophole what, uh, was already mentioned today is the whole uh, procurement process, Prozoro, and that is uh, really making a big change also for state-owned companies because this is now being used at a routine basis and it saves really, as also the ambassador said, billions of grivna and, and maybe even euros. Another loophole which uh, is being closed now, and, and this is really thanks to the good cooperation of many actors, including civil society, but also in the parliament, uh, is the whole question of energy metering and energy billing. It used to be, as a legacy of the Soviet Union, that uh, energy was not really measured, so consumptions were, were based on some sort of artificial standards. Uh, that, of course, led to all sorts of manipulation and to uh, corruption because it only depended on a kind of stamp somewhere uh, to get an approval of how much uh, money you would get. We see also, this is a very interesting case, that the law is there, it's very modern, uh, it's being implemented, but we also see sabotage. So we see people who don't want to have it implemented. And what is funny, and we also heard it today, they use the same words. They, call, they talk about technical problems. They talk about action plans. And for me, this is code word for not wanting to change. And this is also something which we should take into account when we discuss the, the bigger picture. There are zillions of action plans out there. Uh, but we should really measure progress on what is happening on the ground. And for this, we need to work very, very closely with the people on the ground, not only with civil societies, but also with the local administrations, because they see it, they feel it, and they, they have suffered from this. Um, another loophole that was closed, and we hope that it will now uh, come on the right track, was the whole question of uh, privatizations. When you looked at privatizations energy sector, you could really even with the ownership structure still now, you can still identify when it has been privatized, who was in political power, who, who was in favor. Uh, so the electricity distribution companies was one set of beneficiaries. Uh, on, on gas uh, distribution, it's another set of beneficiaries, or it's one major and a couple of others. So there was a moratorium, uh, and now we have a new law, and we hope that we will, on the basis of new laws, be able to proceed with privatizations but I would argue that we should be very, very careful in the implementation of this law, and we should really monitor this very closely because it's a major source of corruption. And we see it, for instance, I mentioned the example where we have now new debt uh, occurring, uh, which would prevent interested parties to, uh, to participate in privatizations. Of course, there are also uh, remaining problems, of, uh, and they are basically the, the legacy of state capture. It's not only a question of corruption, it's really a question of state capture in Ukraine. When you see that in many public administrations, the people were relying on getting brown envelopes from, let's say, beneficiaries of their policy because the salaries were so low. And energy is a fantastic example of this because there's so much money in the sector and the, the salaries have been so low. So we are supporting Ukraine's uh, government uh, in what we call public administration reform, uh, they are now first steps so that uh, people in key positions get a higher salary. Uh, so they, the, the need or the perceived need for brown envelopes should diminish, and uh, that should also be followed by the anti-corruption uh, authorities, the institutions we have been talking about this morning. Uh, but we see they are, the institutions are still relatively weak. For instance, we have now a new law on an energy regulator who should be independent. And that's also part of anti-corruption. It's not only the, the people we had here in, uh, in the first panel. The energy regu regulator has a key role to play. There's a law that uh, the, they should be independent. The implementation has been uh, delayed, so we are now in a kind of crisis mode where hand-picked people without transparent uh, selection criteria are running the energy regulator. We have seen some 
doubtful uh, decisions, uh, which were also in the media, like Rotterdam Plus, etc. Uh, and we very much push and, and, and count on a professional regulator emerging so that trust can actually start to build up, because there is no trust. Uh, another institution which I would like to manage, which is needs our the anti-monopoly committee. They have started, they have some good people, they have started to uh, launch an energy sector inquiry. They never managed to finish it with a meaningful result. So they need strengthening. Uh, so I fully agree, it's multidimensional. We, we should not put anti-corruption on one institution. It does not work. Um, so, of course, we also need to be careful uh, about, uh, let's say, vested interests proposing new sort of business concepts. And uh, what is interesting, they are normally using terminology that we use in the European Union, but they mean something completely different by that. And that is something where we are watching very carefully also in the, in the energy sector. Usually it works like this, that there is a crisis situation and because of the crisis situation they propose some sort of shortcuts which then uh, solidify the, the, the vested interests. And uh, one example we are now working with uh, to, to, to find a viable solution because the initial proposal that we have received was uh, too much in favor of vested interest is how to protect vulnerable customers of gas. Because Ukraine has of course a major, major energy poverty problem the government is responsible, needs to do something, but the solution should not lead uh, to artificially low prices for everyone, including the millionaires, and there are a couple of them, uh, and it should not lead uh, to, the, uh, to, to the, how do you say, ossification of, of structures. So you should open markets, and very much as was presented by, by uh, Naftogaz, it should not only be on the wholesale market, but it should also be the, for the people. The people need to feel the difference, and the people need to feel that they can trust something. For the time being, the trust, and I think not only energy sector of the population, is extremely low. And it's very important that it, in some areas they feel that they can trust and they can, they can do something. Uh, that's why we have now engaged uh, with the Ukrainian government, but also with Germany and the IFC, the uh, International Finance Corporation of the World Bank, to set up a joint uh, energy efficiency fund where people will be supported if they are renovating their own houses. So it will be the, the people who have to demand, the people who have to come with the project, and then they get support. And they will no longer depend on their, uh, what they call the JEC, which is the kind of municipal service company, the, which has a very bad uh, reputation. They will not depend on the goodwill of the local mayor, etc. but they will have, we will try to, to help them to change something, to empower them. Um, and an, a last aspect which I think is very important when we discuss anti-corruption, which is normally not mentioned, is the whole question of consumer rights. Because if people feel that they have some rights and that they can defend their rights, they will have a much better attitude or a less tolerable attitude to, to, uh, to corruption. They will say, this is my right and I'm not supposed to pay for this. I go to the doctor and I have certain rights, and that's part of healthcare reform, etc. Uh, and why should I pay? And this is a this is only via these kind of steps. You renovate your house, you don't have to pay anyone except the guys who are doing the work. You go to the doctor, and you know the doctor is being paid. This is important to change the attitude for anti-corruption. Probably more or less at the same level of having a functioning anti-corruption court. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, also for these last remarks on general aspects of fighting corruption. I think they are all uh, aiming, I mean, the, 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 your comments are very much in, in, a, in agreement with uh, what has been said about the uh, holistic approach and about uh, doing efforts in different areas, starting with education and ending with institutional reforms. Thanks a lot. Now I open the floor for uh, discussions and questions from uh, first maybe the members uh, and Mr. Galler is the first speaker. Yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, my question goes in this area that you just referred to and uh, it, it deals with the, uh, well, with the costs for the consumers uh, of energy indeed. I assume correctly 
uh, that these hundreds of traders that you enumerated there, Trafigura and the others, they are not the ones who are offering something to the end consumer, uh, if, if I'm correct. And so the, the point is that these hundreds of traders, they make their deals with the local suppliers, be it the city administrations or what, what is the structure. And my question then is, those local suppliers who give it, who then are in contact with a private household, these structures, uh, is there an overview that they are not, well, uh, the ones who at the end, at the last stage, then uh, uh, exploit the final consumer because they are charging too many administrative costs because they pay high salaries to their employees or so? How is the situation there and how that can that be supervised from the government or from uh, further uh, from the oblast, whoever is responsible, to avoid that the last mile, so to say, uh, entails additional high costs for the final consumer. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. I will, I will take it from Naftagas. Uh, indeed, uh, we have in the commercial segment of the market, where uh, which is about one third of the, of the whole Ukrainian market, where the commercial uh, companies, the uh, the consumers, they get gas from what, whoever they want. So. There, there's no intermediary between them and the suppliers. And this is the market for which we have this uh, extremely strong competition. The remaining two-thirds of the market are still regulated under the public service obligations uh, scheme, which requires Naftagaz to sell gas to intermediaries. And most of these intermediaries, there is a monopoly company for each region of Ukraine. Most of, most of these intermediaries are controlled by Mr. Firtash, who is currently in detention in Vienna, but he's still very powerful in this market. Uh, the, uh, we also say that it's extremely important to fight this uh, last uh, final mile uh, blockage, which we still have in the market. If uh, the, uh, uh, the prices are liberalized and the intermediaries are removed, all of that huge competition we have in the commercial segment would spill over to the uh, residential sector as well. And this is, what, this is the next step, the next fight on our, on our agenda. They are, um, the gas we have to supply is uh, on, on the regulated price, which is still below the market. But the point is that in addition to the price liberalization issue, there is also debt collection issue. We give gas to some shady intermediaries whom we cannot control. We do not see who consumes the gas. We cannot check them. We cannot claim our money from them because we are obliged to supply no matter what. And this is something which causes huge losses for enough to gas and needs to be corrected. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Just to add on this, this is fully part of the picture which I described that you have to empower people. Uh, because in principle, people should have a choice of suppliers. In practice, they are confronted with a monopoly. In principle, people should be built according to their consumption. In practice, they get some things that nobody really understands. And we are fighting for this, for this transparency, for, for choice, for consumer rights. And this is something which uh, where we meet lots of vested interests, and this is not very, you know, it's so high p on the political agenda, but it's the daily business where people can see the difference. Does the government by any means, uh, are they not interested to, 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 to neutralize Firtash's influence? I mean, Firtash is one of the fiercest enemies of the, of the revolution. I mean, uh, and that's why he is in Vienna and not at home. I mean, can there not be this, influence this monopoly that he has got and uh, can that not be broken up? Unfortunately, he's in Vienna not because he was the enemy of the revolution, but because he uh, uh, bribed some companies in India. Uh, and he is uh, detained not uh, by a Ukrainian authority, but on the, uh, uh, on the request of the American authorities. Um, it's, a, it's a major issue. Yes. He, he's, he's, uh, um, apologies, he's, he's on bail. Uh, uh, when, when he was detained and he, uh, he was assigned a huge bail, 128 million euros, which was uh, uh, financed by, uh, as, we, as we heard, by a karate coach of Mr. Putin. In the same time, we were fighting with him for, to force his companies, his chemical plants, to repay Naftagaz their debt of about 85 million euros. And that was uh, a, very, a very difficult fight for us to, to get this money back. But they have found the money to pay for this uh, bail overnight. 
Yes, it's a legitimate question. And, and this, I was talking about problems with public administration form and state capture. And uh, energy is really like, you know, like, like a, how do you say, looper, like, you know, you, you, you see it like in a magnifying glass, how things, uh, what the problems really are. And one problem is, for instance, if you talk about the gas sector, you don't have so many experts. In any country, you don't have so many experts. And one pool of experts is, of course, with Mr. Firtas' companies. And another pool of experts is with Naftugas. These are the big two players. And uh, when you now hear uh, certain uh, statements that, well, we don't, uh, well, gas, Naftugas is not serving the, the interest of the Europe, uh, Ukrainian people, etc., etc., uh, quite often the government then uh, refers to experts which come from the other pool, which is Mr. Firtas' pool. So even though the state policy is to liberalize, is to uh, have competition, but I was talking about sabotage, you know, and this is then because the expertise comes from the other camp, from the vested interest, and we see it not only on gas, we see it on electricity, for instance, because there's one big pool of expertise, which is called DTEC, which is owned by Mr. Akhmetov, and they have professionals. And it's difficult for, in any circumstance to find good professions which are completely independent of that, because it's a history of, tw of the last 20 years. Uh, so the, and, and then what normally happens, these kind of uh, experts, they propose some sort of action plan, or they talk about technical problems, etc. So it's very important to not underestimate the implementation problems and to really watch it very, very carefully. And also to be very clear on who are reliable experts and who are not. Because uh, if they come to us, they are all friendly and nice and good. Nobody says openly, of course, that they don't like reforms. These days, everybody is in favor of reforms, apart from some fringe politicians uh, in the public sphere. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I don't have other speak, other uh, calls for uh, questions. So uh, now I would like uh, to turn to uh, concluding remarks, and uh, I would like to ask our friend Peter Wagner, who is the head of the Ukraine Support Unit in the European Commission, to uh, present us with uh, concluding remarks after this full morning of discussions. Peter. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for staying uh, till the end. Uh, uh, and going just beyond what is very often discussed when we talk about Ukraine, and that is corruption in general. You also now had one very concrete sectoral discussion with numbers, with examples, and I think that is occasionally important to come down from the abstract uh, buzzwords and look at the sectoral dimension. Um, today was an opportunity to talk about it in Brussels. There was a strong demand. That's also why the Commission and the Parliament worked together on this event, and uh, I think the participation of all of you confirmed that we were right. Uh, we got insights from experts, might not always today now leave here in better mood, but uh, definitely um, with some food for thought for the future, because all the speakers made it clear there are means to fight corruption, and there are technical, but also, of course, political dimensions to be addressed to overcome the situation as it is right now. Overcoming the situation as it is right now means intra alia overcoming vested interests, which is a very general word, but which is key when you talk about these issues. And it's not only vested interest with regard to who controls a specific network in the area of gas or electricity or other areas, but also, of course, who controls at the end of the day society, the development of politics in the country, the overall economic political and societal development of Ukraine. So it's really an issue of the long-term stability of Ukraine as a partner and neighbor for us. And that's why we are investing so much as the EU, as the European Commission, into the fight uh, against corruption, why we are supporting the many, many people in Ukraine being very active in institutions, outside institutions. And let's also, in this context, recall that there are successes possible. There were successes possible in a very concrete, tangible manner in the run-up to the visa liberalization, where an action plan was implemented. 
Now, some of the progress was real, some of the progress was tangible, some of the progress was the creation where announcements, and of course we are now um, jointly in the responsibility to ensure that this acquis is maintained. Um, I think the warning words in the visa liberalization um, report, the first one at the end of the year, last year was relatively clear. There is an obligation, there are expectations that the systems are further developed and that the standards are kept. Um, why that? Now, let's again go into the sectoral, which shows why it's also sectorally so important. There are these discussions about energy union, etc., uh, that Ukraine could join them. Here again, on the sectoral dimension, yes, there are possibilities, but if you look at the action plan which already exists in that area, on the Memorandum of Understanding, many of the measures will require that one continues fighting corruption, fighting state capture and privileged monopolies. I think we have always this kind of sectoral breakdown of the wider policies. That is what is important to keep in mind, that we're not just having here to have the buzzwords celebrated, but to also continue digging at a sectoral level into the problems. So that is what's our joint goal together with our Ukrainian partners, to help the Ukrainian citizens to get the reforms, to co come to the state which they are looking for. And uh, we as a commission are a proud partner in that and can just promise that we will continue being active um, by the side of all those who fight this big, big challenge for Ukraine's future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. And now... Uh Rebecca, please, uh, so concluding remark. One sentence uh, for me uh, would be sufficient uh, to conclude. Uh, I would uh, like uh, to uh, pick up uh, what colleagues have uh, said after the first panel. Uh, we should uh, continue with uh, this um, panel and uh, the results of the panel, uh, the challenges uh, also uh, which uh, were presented to us. We should continue to work with this panel in a different uh, composition in Kiev. Um, for me, it's um, really about uh, gaining uh, ground against reform fatigue uh, and uh, so gaining support uh, for this um, very, very unique uh, cooperation in between Brussels uh, and uh, Ukraine. And uh, so I, um, I, I pass this wish to you because it was uh, so um, you were asked by Michael Gala, who is sitting there and smiling, <laughs> uh, you were asked, Mr. Rosati, uh, to uh, advocate uh, that uh, we have a similar event in Kiev together with our colleagues uh, from RADA and with re representatives uh, from uh, government and also the Bankova, I hope, and maybe also with the participation of other international donors like World Bank and IMF. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, would you like to add something here? Uh, Just yeah. on the radar, I think it's a very good idea and it's also important to involve other committees mm -hmm. because, for instance, the Energy Committee, they are in the forefront on many of these issues and they are, I mean, they would certainly profit from being involved. Okay, it seems uh, like a good idea. <laughs> then uh, I would like to uh, tell, well, expressing my thanks to all the speakers, of course, uh, I, I want to stress that the uh, issue of the fight against corruption uh, features prominently in our program here, uh, the program of work for the, of the Parliamentary Committee for Ukraine. Uh, in the coming PAC meeting next month, we have a special session reserved for that. And uh, 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 of course, this is not the end of the story. Uh, in reply to Mr. Boni's uh, question, we certainly uh, have to probably uh, think about a, a special event that would uh, uh, engage and involve also uh, Ukrainian officials from different parts of the of the government and uh, civil society in order to make sure that that this fight against corruption is not just uh, a, a hobby of several people or responsibility of several institutions, but this is a wide-ranging, all-encompassing program that is indeed wholeheartedly supported by the by the Ukrainian authorities. Because my sense is, dear friends is that it, there is a lack of determination on the side of fight against corruption. I mean, uh, everybody pays a lip service to that, as it was said, everybody is supporting uh, notionally reforms and everything, but still, when it comes to specific deeds, to specific facts, we have to wait for establishment of, of the anti-corruption court, 
we've been waiting already one year, and we heard today that it, take, it will take another year to establish a court. And similar, uh, uh, similar uh, worries are about these e-declarations. <coughs> and this is, again, something which, frankly, we are a bit worried uh, and, and we fail to understand why the promise that, uh, uh, on the basis of which the NGOs and uh, people, uh, whistleblowers in principle, would be excluded from the work of this law is still not uh, implemented. And the deadline is the end of this month. And I, I'm not sure whether something will, uh, positive will happen. We see quite a lot of resistance. Let me be very frank. We see a lot of resistance in Verkhovna Rada, in other institutions. There are a lot of vested interests here that are against this. Uh, and uh, dear Ukrainian friends, uh, I have to tell you very frankly, this is in your interest. This is not, I mean, we are very much in favor of that, but we in the European Union can live with uh, uh, Ukraine be being, uh, I mean, uh, engulfed in, in endemic corruption. This is, uh, this is your business in order to eliminate and eradicate corruption. If I go to my constituency and, ask, and my voters ask me, what do you do in the European Parliament? And my answer is, I help Ukraine to fight corruption. So they say first, as Mark Demesmacher said, okay, so what are the results of that? And secondly, why do you bother? You do something for us. So if I say, okay, the results are half glass, half full, half empty, we still are, we have roadmaps and action plans and everything, and, and we proceed and we proceed, so the people can get uh, uh, impatient on that. <clears throat> this is our obligation to help. This is our obligation to assist our neighbors. But the primary interest is on you and obligation to fight this. So we expect really to, uh, to, to cooperate. To, uh, I mean, it's been a very interesting session. A lot of observations have been made. Uh, a, a lot of good conclusions, like on this, that you, you cannot probably efficiently fight corruption unless you address, I mean, the whole, a whole range of uh, issues and a whole, whole range of uh, uh, stakeholders to be involved in that, starting with schools. I'm uh, uh, insisting on that because uh, uh, simply uh, <coughs> this, this, is, this is an issue which is, first of all, decisive to, uh, to the political decisions here in the European Union about the extend the scale and the amount of financial assistance, but not only that. Uh, this is an issue which determines the willingness, ability, and uh, readiness of, uh, of European uh, member states to, to cooperate and, uh, and to assist Ukraine. <coughs> uh, I don't want to be, of course, uh, excessively pessimistic. We also we see quite, quite a lot of progress, but, uh, but uh, still uh, my feeling is that uh, this, uh, these efforts on the on the side of, the num of a number of uh, Ukrainian institutions are half-hearted, I would say. Uh, but uh, uh, we are not going to give up, let me tell you, frankly. Uh, and we will uh, uh, insist and we will uh, uh, speak up and uh, this issue will be at the center of our attention. Don't be angry with the European Union that we pay so much attention to anti-corruption. Uh, we have to have uh, something to show to our voters that our money, which goes to Ukraine, it will not be wasted. So this is something we have to insist on. Uh, and uh, uh, this is all what I wanted to say. Let me once again express my thanks to all the participants of this uh, very interesting meeting, especially to our speakers. And let me uh, uh, call on them still to uh, stay in touch with us and uh, uh, join us in our efforts to, uh, to work together with uh, Ukrainian citizens to eradicate uh, corruption and, uh, uh, and also specifically in the energy sector. And uh, there will be more meetings of this sort coming up in the future. And now I wish you good luck and uh, have a nice lunch. <laughs>